And now, holy shit, folks. I always remind people, you know I am suspended for life for minor <laughs> hockey. <laughs> it's my duty to please the booty. Did you catch a rattlesnake and then drive home with it in your car holding it the whole time? <laughs> yep. Phil only drinks Coke. He doesn't drink water. I fucking quit. Fugazis. Fugazi. Fugazis. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 427 of Spit and Chick. Let's present the by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. What's going on, gang? The boys kicked off a crazy February down in South Florida last weekend. Skills competition, all-star game, biz. Who knows where he ended up, but let's check on the boys, see how they're feeling. Producer Kodak, Mikey Grinelli. Co- Kodak Black's <laughs> Trap House. That's where I fucking ended up on Friday night. And we interviewed Rob Brindamore, guys. I didn't have any sleep. I'm just going to come clean right off the gate here. All right, though, for being in Lauderdale all weekend at All-Star, that hello is a 12 out of 10. And you wow. sound fine. What did you get yourself into off the hop here? You got to tell us because you sound great. You didn't really have your your usual gong show style trip. It, it was pretty much the opposite of the Boston weekend we had here. I was, I think, not only in bed but sleeping by midnight every night. I'm old man. I just can't go go like I used to without, um, you know, some Red Bulls. You might say. So uh, I was in bed early. I was well behaved for my standards this week, but I had a great I time see, nonetheless. Uh, applause! Hey, applause time. from the group for that. Ra. Being the grown you know up. you're a fucked up cat when you get an applause for just like acting like a normal human. <laughs> for being the most sober. <laughs> good job. But I think I Merles might who, be lapping me. Hell of a job. I tell you who wasn't a normal civilian was uh, 30-year-old Mike Grinnell. Happy birthday, pal. Ooh. Happy birthday. Buddy. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. 3-0 uh, but- today. 3-0 today. Yeah, Bean Pop Monday, 3-0. No better way to, to enter your 30s than to, to stay up all night, Saturday night, head to the airport at 6 a.m., think you're doing something good, and then not get home till 10 p.m. Oh. So it was, it was a tough, tough day of travel for me. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's how I enter the 30s. Well, the, boy, the boys got lauderdaled, as Wit would like to call it. Liquordaled. Li- Liquordaled. <laughs> oh, yeah. Liquordaled, excuse me. I, all of us have a story. Your travel situation, wit. You, your health, your phone got held hostage at some point. Oh you had a tough God. morning, uh, a Sunday morning, waking up. At I've what, had a six- tough, tough week. And for a guy who doesn't like to complain, you know, it's just about <laughs> moving forward. Like I might do some complaining this week, but I'll go to Grinelli quickly. Grinelli released a video about how much JetBlue was hammering them around. And gee, yeah. let me tell you, when they bring you on the plane, make you sit on the on the on the tarmac, and then they don't take off for hours, and then tell you the plane's broken and won't let you get off. That's horrible. I felt brutal for you. No joke. You were the biggest help of all time to your boy Witty on Friday night. Just an absolute legend and a great friend. But you po- posted the video of you on the plane with the with the child screaming, "Hell on earth!" Hell and I just earth. mentioned to you like. For everyone out there who doesn't have kids, when a kid is crying on a plane, it's a kick in the dick for everyone. I I could not understand more what you're talking about, but there is no person in the world who feels worse than the parents of that kid because you are helpless, you're absolutely in one, and there's nothing you can do to get a kid to stop crying. So I actually have had times when our kids were screaming, crying on a plane, and I was just so on edge and freaking out that I was like, please, somebody say something to me. I want to kill someone right now. I probably would have got dummied if something had ever gone down. But I know you were pissed, but you just got to feel for the parents. And I saw some people on Twitter like, don't bring your kids on plane. Fuck off, buddy. I'm going on vacation. I, don't, I really don't care in the end if you're struggling you throughout you the plane. You don't fly them underneath? Oh no! Yeah, sometimes they go with the dogs in cages. It's not those are the only those are the the only misbehaved kids. Though oh, well, you put a case, muzzle I'm, on them too. I'm, in that case, I'm definitely not having kids. No, oh, God, no! I, I knew that to begin with. But gee, I did feel real bad for you. That's a kick in the dick. Yeah, it was tough too because they. So I, I, you know how I am. Right when I get on the airplane, I fall asleep. So right when we get on, Same. I fall asleep and I wake up and we still haven't taken off and it's an hour. It's like an hour and a half later. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on? And the lady next to me is like, oh, they they said the plane is unsafe to fly. They haven't told us anything else. Well, then three hours go by and we still haven't heard anything else. And the worst part is, is I have a perfect direct sight at all like the stewardess just crushing pretzels. They're laughing, <laughs> telling stories. They're drinking water, just having a grand time. And a half. <laughs> I have no water. I have no snacks. My throat's parched. I was dead. Dying and these people, they're having a grand old time up front. I wanted to, I wanted to kill myself. It was terrible. <laughs> it was just mocking you, ate, like sticking their head out, being like, oh. oh yeah, oh yeah. They're just, like, want to cheese it? Help. 
<laughs> and they knew, and they and they knew I didn't eat a single thing all weekend. I go on these chicklets trips. I like my Adderall. I don't eat, and it's they just they were taunting me. Gee, for a guy who travels as much as you do, how do you not have noise busted headphones for such situations? Because I don't travel without them, man. I don't. I don't want to get into this because this might lead to like a way darker, deeper conspiracy. Whoa. But I'm oh, fully. I'm fully off of Bluetooth headphones. I, I was watching this video on TikTok one night at three a.m. Oh, yeah, how legit. like TikTok oh. like it, it can't be good for your head. It like burns your brain. So I only do plug-in headphones now. But Cordelli, yeah, right. you eat trash and take Adderall all the time. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's worse than a Bluetooth headphone in your eardrum. Well, exactly. So it's like if I got two strikes against me, like, like why have three, you know? Fair. Jesus. What a Good horrible point. reason for not doing the noise cancers. Yeah, oh, I guess. Just it's just, uh, I'm just a pathetic human as we've as we Well, learned. now that you're 30, I'm sure you'll grow up a little bit. And, <laughs> hey, I mean, hey, Hopefully. that's the, one, one way to go out in style, though. What a weekend, R.A. Uh, Wit, do you want to go into your, uh, your shit show with the house? With yeah, the, so I'll you take you through begin? quickly. Um, so granted, I left Tuesday and got back Saturday. I'm then leaving Tuesday. I'm leaving tomorrow for Scott till I get back Saturday. So, I mean, when you're gone eight nights out of a possible, I don't know what, 12, and you got two young kids, you're kind of in one. Well, not to mention we're redoing the basement. My friend Chris Paul is doing an amazing job, and we had to get everything waterproof. We can't have any more water in the basement once you got a putting green and a, and a, and, a, and a sh area for my kids to play hockey and a hot cup toll tub. We just had to make sure it was all good. I was told a couple months back, doesn't it feel great? You know there'll never be water in here again by the guy. Yeah, it feels awesome. Well, <clears throat> left Tuesday. Actually crashed my car to a pole parking my car at the airport Tuesday after a road raid inc incident getting on the highway. So that was a little disaster in terms of getting to the airport. Well, then I get a call that we got water in the basement. So the old guarantee, and aren't you happy that you'll never have water in your basement again? That was false. That was a phantom call. <laughs> so there's water in the basement. So now the basement can't continue until we figure out that there'll never be water in there again. Who knows if that'll ever happen? Wednesday, I get the call from my wifey. Yeah, so the heat's off in our house. The heat broke. Um, in about two days, it's going to be minus 10 degrees in Boston. Now, now I'm in Florida. Now, for any married guy out there, whether you're on a work trip, buddy's trip, doesn't matter. If your wife's in minus 10 and you're at Fort Lickerdale, you're in trouble. <laughs> it's just how it goes. That's marriage, baby. And so I said, holy shit. So, all right, I'm going to go to my mom's for a few nights. <clears throat> That's still not fixed. So my house is 52 right now. I don't mind it, but I, I like that cold weather. So all that's going on and I'm down in Liquordale and Friday night, we can get into that later. I don't know. I got my phone basically stolen by some scumbag Uber. Well, not to mention that. So I get home Saturday. On the way home, I get a text from her. Let me read this text. Hey, you may want to mix in a few waters on the way home. <laughs> I'm leaving tomorrow morning to get stuff done. I don't know when I'm going to be home. You got the kids. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> oh no. You know, like a oh. Sunday with the kids, you're in one. And sure as sure, shit, she left at 10 a.m. She got back at about 7.30 p.m. And she wasn't Ooh. bullshitting me. Yeah, she well, she gets home. She gets home. Now, we're, we're at uh, her parents' house. I said, listen, I'm going to take Ryder home. I don't mind. The, the house was like 58. I could sleep in that. Ryder will sleep in bed with me. I can load him up with a sweatshirt and stuff. I got to go to the city early. I'll take him to school. No problem. So we get home at 8 o'clock. I was so excited. I was literally putting him into bed, getting next to him into bed, and I was going to sleep. I'm done, liquor-dailed. Dude, I opened the garage door. There was gallons and gallons of water coming through the ceiling, <laughs> ruining everything. My pink Whitney scooter, all this stuff completely drenched. I'm stepping in water. I'm like, oh, no, our bedroom's above this room. I ran upstairs. The ceiling to our bedroom, because the fucking heat broke in the house, a pipe burst. Oh my God. The ceiling was busted open with water pouring down like it was an Amazon rain rainforest. <laughs> what are those things? Waterfall. Riders like this. Oh, no, Dad. What's going on? I go, I don't know. I don't know. I'm calling my wife. She's not answering. Dude, everything's ruined. It's done. So the heat's, the house has no heat. I don't have a bedroom or a garage. And water's down in the new basement that can't get finished yet. So I am 
in one in all terms. I I had to, then I took him back to the in laws. Then I came back. Then I had to get the dog. It was just I didn't go to sleep till midnight. I'm gassed right now, boys, and I don't have any of those artificial energy su- supplements that Grinelli likes to chew on. I'm going just full oh, throttle natural. right now wow. on all natural with a shit bag house. My house is a joke. I, I should have bought this house and tore it down and built a new one. I'm just like, whatever. I'm fucking done with it. Um, insurance will cover it, but I don't know where I'm going to be sleeping. But here's the thing, boys. I'm off to Scottsdale. Good luck, honey. Oh. Good luck figuring it out this Jesus. week. Jesus Christ. You, yeah. might, uh, you, you might have to do another uh, um, honeymoon. Another honeymoon trip. You might be spending another month in Jamaica on a vacation after what If I doing. wasn't turning 40 in like a week, I'd probably be just even more shit. But you can't really get that mad at me. 40 is a big birthday. Well, selfishly, the Wi-Fi and lighting's working, so here we are. And and uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, hey, should we just go right into the Uber story from here? I mean, Friday, I, I, Friday overall for for me specifically was a shit show. I didn't end up sleeping on Friday at all, right into Saturday, into the Rob Brindamore interview, and then we had to go to go do a, a, a meet and greet at was it Bose? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was probably. a cool bar. Oh, that was a great time. The fans were awesome. I I, I mean, could you tell I hadn't slept? Oh, so 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 I, <laughs> so the Brindamore interviews at ten a.m. I left uh, American Social, a bar that we went to. Uh, I don't know, like one fifteen maybe. Because granted, we had had a sandbagger Friday, guys, and we could tell you right now, David Pasternak and Kevin Fiala, nice enough to join us. I'm sorry, that was Thursday, right? Thursday, yeah, yeah Thursday. That happened. So we were all interview. excited. We, we were all excited that we'd got so much stuff done, and then so Friday night, all right, let's have a time. Well, I'd lost my phone. I can get into that in a little bit. And um, I walked out of American Social. Now, I had been drinking Red Bull vodka, shots of tequila from Scumbag Grinelli, high noons, espresso martinis. My stomach isn't exactly (laughs) prepared to handle all that. I walked out of American Social and on the walk home, while walking, puked like seven times. Just an absolute disgrace. I said it's a childish behavior by a soon-to-be 40-year-old father of two. It's a fucking joke. But either way, I still got my seven hours in. So I woke up around 8.15 or maybe maybe a little earlier. I texted Biz, hey, let's grab breakfast across the street before Brenda Moore. Biz walks in, <laughs> looks at me, and goes, I haven't slept one minute. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you actually looked incredible. If I didn't sleep for one minute, dude, I'd be looking like R.A. You looked phenomenal. <laughs> you, Fucking you were, you, you were, You were like, you, I was like, how is this guy even functioning it was, it, right it now? Was, it, was the, well, it was the liquid glazed tan from the golf course. Exactly. That's what it was. The tan saved me. The tan the saved The tan me. looked great on you. I'll tell you what. Every, I, I spent every single ounce of energy in my body to stay alive during that interview and nod my head and, and try to act normal. But the funniest part about it is when he walked in, he goes, I'm surprised you guys have slept. And I go, oh, no, how did he word it? Did he he walked in and he goes, oh, boys, you guys been to sleep yet? And he totally hadn't even really seen us. He was just joking. I go, no, nah, Biz hasn't slept one minute. How'd you know? It was unbelievable. And so when the interview drops, folks, great interview. Rod Brindamore, yeah. awesome. It was, it was. I think everyone will really enjoy it. Biz was in the room. He just couldn't speak. <laughs> no. Did I he say one thing? I played a fourth-line role. I played a fourth-line role. I, 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 I got my possession. I dumped it in, played it safe, went and changed. I played three shifts, just like my entire career, guys. But, hey, when you're banged up, you just stay out of the way, and you simplify your game. Right, R.A.? Yeah, man, you grounded it out. I didn't know. You, I didn't think you looked that bad at all. I mean, obviously you had a few cocktails, but I didn't think you were no worse for the way. You chimed in enough that it wasn't like you were a total fucking mutant. No, he didn't. <laughs> I, I, I thought he did a couple times. No, I appreciate we'll, we'll it. No, shit, I think he asked right. one question, which actually was a great question that Brenda Moore was like, I can't answer that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we also interviewed our Montreal captain, Nick Suzuki. That's going to yeah. be coming on in a little bit. Then Brenda Moore after him. Uh, last, I'm sorry, Vegas Golden Knight Chandler Stevenson. And Buffalo Sabre defenseman Rasmus Dahlin. He was awesome, man. Had great energy. Real, like, yeah. You can tell you got a real good personality. Had a good chat with him. Going to be coming later down the line. Uh, what else was going on, boys? El Camino. We, 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 the... we got to talk about Witt losing the phone right. Friday night. Okay. We got to get into it. Well, Uber is just full of complete dirtbags. And there's some wonderful people that drive Ubers. I've met some amazing people, but some of them are just downright dirty scoundrels. And when you... So, so let me say this. Um... There is no worse setup to get into arena than the Florida Panthers. I mean, I'm talking foolish 
ridiculous stuff to try to just get there. There's about 15 different hills you can walk up to. No, they drop us off about a mile from the entrance. Then you got to walk in front of the building. We considered hopping the fence, but we couldn't. So it was about a mile walk from where we got dropped off. I get up to the front where, uh, you know, you got to put your things through the metal detector. I don't have my phone. I said, oh, my God. I need this phone. I'm traveling home tomorrow. Well, Grinelli ordered the Uber, so gee, you can't go in either because you're you have the Uber app. Well, Uber got rid of the ability to call the driver. I don't know if they had people like getting to beefs or whatnot. I guess I kind of understand it. So you got to go through the Uber like robot. I don't even. It was like yeah, a robot. it's a robot, and so like they're asking us the same questions on a chat. I'm just like, please give us the guy's number. Please give us the guy's number. About an hour and a half goes by. We've now walked back to like that shitbag mall they have across the street from the terrible <laughs> Panthers arena, and we found like uh, what were we at? I don't we know. We were sitting at a yard house. A yard house. Okay. Now I'm watching the skills competition. <laughs> what a skills competition! They shouldn't change a thing. So G and I are now in contact with this guy because the Uber robot finally was like, can we share your number with the guy? Well, we remembered on the ride into the arena, he didn't speak a word of English. So I said, oh, fuck, dude. Even if this guy calls, he can't speak English. Well, what does Witty do? I use my brain immediately. And I said to the woman next to me, do you speak Spanish? No. She said, no, you start running around the, the room in there and you're like, who speaks Spanish? Who speaks Spanish? Okay. And finally guess- some lady came over and was like, what's going on, sir? I, I speak Spanish. I can help. <laughs> I guess I didn't word that properly. Lickerdale. This woman was an angel sent from heaven to help me. <laughs> I'm t- I'm, no, I'm not kidding you. One of the nicest, most kind-hearted people. She's working a double at the yard house. All she's thinking about is helping me. She's like, I'll help you, sir. I'll help you. So she's back and forth on the phone with this guy. And all of a sudden, oh, I'm back in Miami already. I'm back in Miami. He's, he, you know, she's, in, she's telling me what he's saying. I'm like, how is he back in Miami already? Like, it's like an hour and a half from here and whatever. So he's like, oh, well, I need money to come back. Which, like, wait, I, I don't wait, know. wait. Meanwhile, we're getting screenshots sent to us from Murley, from all all people who are texting yes. you saying if you want your if your friend wants his phone back, it's going to be a thousand dollars in Spanish, not even in English. Yes. So now I don't oh, know. Sure. Now, technically, that's that's straight up extortion, brother. That's not allowed. Now, if he were to say like, I, I yeah, I want some money to come back. Like, I don't know if that's illegal. Like, does he technically have to come back with my phone because I left it there? I don't know. He could just be like, oh, it's not in the car. I don't know. Like, and he shut the phone. Fo- he shut my phone off, so we couldn't track it by by uh, find my iPhone. So he he finally agrees to come back for two hundred dollars. Now I'm going through the girl the whole time. So I gave. So finally he gets back. Now dude, this is ten o'clock. The skills have ended. Me and Grinelli had a great conversation. Just That's when you were giving me tequila shots and stuff. I was so mad. So he comes back. He comes back finally. She walked me outside. I, I gave her $100. She wouldn't even take it. She was so nice. I, I, I shoved it in her waitress thing. And I said, listen, thank you so much. You're the biggest help. I appreciate it. No problem. She said, don't give this guy $200. She goes, you shouldn't even give him anything. I was like, oh, whatever. I'll give him 100 bucks then. So I go over. The guy who drove us is sitting in the passenger seat like this, smiling with my phone. <laughs> There's another guy driving, and they're both like laughing. I go, "Can I have my phone?" He goes, two hundred bucks." I give him a hundred. The guy driving speaks English. He goes, "No, man, you said two hundred. I go, "Give me my fucking phone back." Like a tough guy, like I would do something. He goes, "No, two hundred dollars." So I go, "Fine. I got a 50. <laughs> gave him 50 more. And he still said, "No, two hundred dollars." And then the guy with my phone goes, "No, no, 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 no. No mas, no mas." and handed it to me. So I finally got it back, but just the whole thing, I didn't get to go into the skills. I missed a barn burner too. What a skills event. But it was just about the like the, the whole like racket in terms of Uber All that being able for to- $150, like to oh my goodness. It sounded like it sounded like you were describing the movie Man on Fire with the drop off. Like I thought he was gonna will, pull up with Ryder in the back seat with a I will with, give you his, his her wrist life taped up for your life. Her life. <laughs> You're you're like ready to sacrifice Grinnell to get your fucking iPhone. I, I chucked him in the back. Is, I'm like, you hey, could sell him for big money. Which hey, which the 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 like the, the the cherry on top of it all. You didn't even talk about the fact that the night before you had dropped a water bottle on your bra- brand new MacBook, yep. and yep. and then now that's kaput. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I dropped talk, the water in my. So Fort Fort Lauderdale put your ball bag in an absolute vice. 
My computer was broken. My house is falling apart. I had no phone, and my wife hates me. Have a week. Jesus. <laughs> fucking Tim Jackman part two over here. Florida playing the role. Is he got Tim Jackman. Jackman. Exactly. But without that, without that wonderful waitress, Audri- Adriana, I mean, I can't thank her enough. Just a great person looking to help out others and then not even wanting to accept the money I was offered. Thank you. Without her, I do not have my phone back. Maybe people don't care about this story. It was kind of a had to be there. But in the end, like, it's a night I'll never forget. Yeah. And guys, overall, an incredible weekend. We'll get into the our thoughts on the uh, the skills comp and the game itself. But just like getting down there to see a bunch of Chicklets fans, obviously a ton of hockey fans. Uh, we mentioned the meet and greet. We got a bunch of great interviews. And this fucking sandbagger we're going to have coming out with Pasta and Fiala, guys. This is the only thing I'm going to give away. We agreed to do group birdie juice. And there ended up being four birdies in the first, what, six holes? So we just had a liquid glaze on for the entire time. Well, I think one of Pasta's lines was like, now you're going to get to see the real pasta. And, <laughs> and you got to see the real pasta. So a couple young guns. I never really spent any time with Fiala. What a fucking, not only a man missile, but what a guy. What a guy. I loved it. I loved it. Pasta is just hilarious. And Fiala. Man, we need to take some strokes away early on. I'll mention that. But I think I pick March 15th the date, so be excited. I think it'll be one of our uh, more more enjoyable ones in terms of viewing and just laughing at two, two studs in the league right now. Guys and girls, before we go any further, we just need to talk about our presenting sponsor, the wonderful drink known as Pink Whitney. Thank you so much to New Amsterdam. I've said it forever. I'll say it for the rest of my life. Without them, who knows where this podcast is. And now because of them, Pink Whitney is everywhere. When I say everywhere, many bars, if if not every bar you go into, they have the option for Pink Whitney. We were just down in Fort Lauderdale. It was flowing throughout the entire city. We had the nips going on the golf course. No better drink on the golf course than Pink Whitney. We loved having it. And now we're going off to Scottsdale where it also just crushes at the Barstool Bar. So thank you so much to everyone who drinks it give it a try if you've never had it whether you want to mix it with some soda water whether you want to drink it on the rocks or whether you want to shoot it like after we make big time birdies it's the play all the time no matter the weather no matter the land drink pink whitney and shout out to new amsterdam vodka biz uh before we get to the, all the festivities last weekend uh you called on another team on tnt you're pissed off at yet another fan base the islanders g why don't you roll the clip I would love to see the Buffalo Sabres in playoffs. They're way more exciting to watch than the Islanders. The Islanders are the most boring team in the NHL. I do not want them making playoffs. I don't care if all of Long Island hates my guts. They are a snooze fest. Snooze fest. I got to go back there. Come on. Yeah, That's Liam's Thanks, team biz. You did not hold back. What, I mean, I've been, what's... we've been talking about that on the podcast for three years. I think it's kind of old news. I guess you say it on TNT and you rile people up. And then on top of that, Lou sends one of his goons at me. Loon's a full-fledged mafia guy. He oh, yeah, for Butch sure. Butch Goring, 73-year-old Butch Goring to come do his dirty work. So now I got to fucking go a, a senior citizen and a rough and rowdy. <laughs> now I got to go a senior citizen and the rough and rowdy, Butch Goring. Butch has more cups than you have, like, games played, dude. Like, you're fucking... <laughs> He'll shove you in put a his, locker. Put, put his hockey DB mugshot up on this fucking <laughs> clip right here if you're watching the YouTube version. What a fucking beauty. I'll tell you what. I offered him a, a chance to come on the pod. I said, how can you watch a, a full 60 minutes of Islander hockey without consuming any any Red Bulls or any of the stuff that uh, 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 Grinelli's consuming? Listen, this trade, though, like, do you, are we going to get into the Islanders talk now then? Yeah. Yeah, we got the little whole well, of that talk the while we're doing Because the trade happened, and then all of a sudden, like, Man, Lou's kind of turning into a bit of a cartoon character where he's he's like Jerry Jones where he's been dropping some heat. Like he, they asked him about the contract that Bo Horvat signed. They said, what didn't you like about it? He said what? He said term term and money? No, I think too they long, said, what, I think money. they said, too- what is it? What are you paying him? And he's like, ah, it's too long and it's for too much money. I said, holy shit, imagine signing that deal and then your GM immediately dogs the term and the amount. I mean, fuck me, man. So if he, that he, guy he, doesn't score, Lou's gonna put a hit out oh on him. My. Well, let hey, let's call a spade a spade. Does everyone agree that this is Lou's last year? No, I don't you think don't, so. No chance. You don't. No. Oh, no, I don't think so. I I thought it. I mean, he's got to hang it up at some point. You you think he's gonna see this Picasso through? All these uh, well, older guys he's got signed to contracts. This is a well, boys. This is a huge hedge, man. 
Is this, is this a, like uh, a biz? Is this like a biz inside source thing that you heard? Like that, like you know that you're not telling us because I haven't heard this or seen this anywhere. And yeah, this I seems heard like it at you the trap house confident. Friday at six a.m. with Kodak. <laughs> I'll tell you that's, though, like that's what, what's exactly funny is where I fucking I, heard it. I've kind of been <laughs> I've been bullish on the Islanders. I was with I still, Lou there. I, he told I me still, that's right. It's all coming together. Oh shit! Yeah, Lou is the guy who wouldn't let you go we, to bed. We, so we were fucking rolling dice, and he goes, "How about that move?" He's like, "Fucking pulled one out of my ass, didn't I, busy dog?" What were you gonna <laughs> I, say, I think Rick? the Islanders are going to get in. You do. Um, I, I I've just because before the season I said they were going to get in, so I'm going to stick to it because they got a goal score. But what's odd to me is if, if you talk to fans like. How could an Islanders fan not agree that they're boring? They score maybe two goals a game throughout this year, and that's if they're lucky. They play a slowdown system because they can't score, so they have to try to give up no goals. They have this wonderful goal to use, definitely in the Vesna race, but the team is boring as shit to watch. I don't really understand how a fan base and Butchie Goring would take offense to a, 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 a statement of fact by you. And keep in mind, there was 11 games in a row before they ended up winning those those two games. They won 2-1, and I, I want to say one nothing or maybe 2 nothing. So they still hadn't scored more than two goals. <laughs> but that 11-game stretch, they hadn't scored a fucking goal in the third period, man. Like, I'm like, and every time I've turned them on, it's like watching paint dry. And no doubt in my mind that Bo Horvat's the type of guy who can really like spark a lineup and obviously he's having a career year and just all of a sudden make the guys on his wing a little bit better. But holy fuck, man, how could you possibly take any offense to that in the way that they, they play? And some people are saying like, no, that's the way they played under trots. It's like they were probably scoring more goals per game on average than they are right now. So stop talking about how boring. At least they were winning when trots was fucking coaching. When you're winning, I guess when you're winning the two one games, it ain't that boring. Because at least they were mucking it up. But holy shit, they're not winning much. They they can't win back to back games. They can't fucking score in the third period, and they can't win a game without uh, with with scoring more than two goals. So I'm sorry if the whole fucking fan base wants to be offended. But finally, I guess I said it on national television for the uh, television for the first time. I guess they they've probably all blocked the spit and chicklets account by now, so they haven't been seeing these clips come up where we've been saying it every fucking month since the last two and a half years. So I don't know, R.A., you tell me, buddy. Are they boring to watch, or do you like that old-school style where they have to rely on goaltending and they just muck it up all night? I mean, it's not my preference to watch it, but I will say it's the type of, of style of play you got to have in the playoffs. So they play a playoff style during the regular season. And with the goaltending they have, man, if they can get in the playoffs, they can make some noise just based on the goaltending and the system they have. Uh, and just to give the numbers on Horvat, he ended up signing an eight-year extension worth $68 million. It's an $8.5 million average annual value. So he's going to have him there for, well, at least eight years if he wants. He's got a no trade for the first four and then a modified no trade clause for the uh, final four. He's got 54 points, 49 games so far. I'll be 36 when the deal ends. We'll see how it ages. But I don't know. I did like Lou's quote. All I can tell you, it's too long and it's too much money. You want the truth? But he was talking about the, the setup in general, not, not specifically about Bo. But says it was the guy, to come out says right the guy who offered a 24-year deal to Ilya Kovalchuk <laughs> into, his, into his 60s. This guy tried to put on a rubber strap on and fuck the CBA right in the goddamn arsehole. And then he's talking about term and money like well he's got to do it at this point no what's crazy is Horvat is having a career year unlike any other season he's ever even sniffed last year was I think the first year he scored 30 uh, consistent you know 20 goal guy then he had 27 and 18 19 last year he got 31 52 points though dude I'm very happy for him that's unbelievable but eight and a half a year and the most points he's ever had is 61 points. That That's what timing is, folks. You got to do it at the he right bet, time. He bet on himself. I believe he was offered a contract by Vancouver. And the contract came in under JT Miller's. And he's like, well, I'm the captain here. And, like, you know, I think that, you know, I'm just as good as a player. And that's what – isn't that around what JT Miller got? Or did he end up getting He got nine? seven and a half, I think. Oh, JT Miller did? Yeah. Okay, so but he but he obviously got the term, right? He got the full eight years. Wow. So I guess like, yeah, but yeah, I still like his game, and I still think he has a well-rounded game where, yeah, maybe it's a slight overpayment, but you also intact like the leadership, and then now he's going to be surrounded by, I guess you could say, maybe not more talented players, but overall like good, solid players. 
No, like the like, like J- JT about, Miller had a eight mil cap hit, just a eight mil. Throw, yeah, it so was obviously mil. he kind of took offense Whoops. to that and gambled on himself and won. Yeah, I, I, so that probably sets the market for Larkin now. Well, what that's we, why Larkin now is like, all right, if he's getting eight and a half, I mean, what am I going to get or what can I get? He won't get that from Detroit. We've talked about Larkin enough. I actually get to play golf with Larkin. What a great guy. Uh, Keith Yandel took myself, Kevin Hayes, Mark Stahl, Larkin. Um, uh, Anthony Melch, kid from around here, buddies with Kevin Hayes, and a guy, Maddie Williams, who works for CAA to the Grove. It was a hell of a day. Larkin hates giz- Biz's guts. No, oh, he my doesn't. God, he came amazing. up on Friday night, and I said, listen, I talked to Stevie, final offer, eight and a half, we'll match with Horvat guy, and he took it. He shook my fucking hand in the bar. What's the bar called again? American Social. American Social. There you go, Detroit fans. I locked it in for you. Eight times 8.5. Back to you, Rick. <laughs> no, I mean... I think that uh, I think that, that Horvat's going to make a huge difference on the Islanders, and he pretty much has to. I mean, if he doesn't go there and start scoring, it's like what? If he doesn't score there, they're so fucked. This is kind of their last. Like, what else are they going to do? It's their only option was to bring someone in. That's why I said when they traded him, I respected Lou. He went out and kind of walked the walk or talked the talk, then walked the walk in terms of making something happen. So we'll see if he can t- can continue this torrid pace. I think he's playing with Barzal and Josh Bailey. He's on the number one power play, so I wouldn't be surprised to see him keep scoring. But he better That's why because I thought that it team was needs his last it. year because like all of a sudden he felt this like like this obligation to make this big move where I felt like it was a bit of a panic move where he's like I can't let this be my my Islanders legacy so he's got to try to somehow make playoffs and leverage a lot of the future like if they don't make fucking playoffs this year after giving away what they got I don't know man that's fucking that's yeah tough. they're in trouble so you're convinced they're making playoffs I'm not convinced but I think they still can all right you. Way. Uh, I do. I think they. Yeah, I think they do. They're tenth in the East, fifty-five points. They're two back at Pittsburgh. They have played three more games, but yeah, I think this is. A, it's like a huge addition to put this guy in the lineup. It rip, has a nice ripple effect in the lineup. The goaltending's been ideal for them. I do think the Islanders get in. It's uh, just crazy. There's six teams locked in in my mind, right? The the three in the Atlantic and the, the three in the Metro aren't going anywhere. And shout out Rangers Devils first round, which I believe will happen. What a goddamn series that'll be. So then it's Pittsburgh, Washington, Buffalo, Islanders, right? I mean, it's like in uh, and, and Florida, no chance. You can't even get into their rink. But if the Islanders get in, what's wild is I think that means Washington or Pitt doesn't. So that would be think, a story I, in itself. I think they'll come humming out of the all-star break here because they got Philly – I want to say they got Ottawa, Montreal. They got some bottom feeders. And then they, I think they in the sixth game, they play the Bruins. So I think it, they could go win like four of the next five. So they could definitely get off to a hot start. I'm not the gambling guy. I know EBR takes care of that or, or, or URA. But if, if I was a betting man, I would be betting hard on the Islanders coming out of the All-Star break. I mean, they're going to beat Philly. They got to. Who do they got? Who do they got the next four after that, Grinnell? You can read them off before we end up moving on here. Yeah, I know they were like 35 to 1 at the beginning of the year. So, so I heard. <laughs> oh, you got a future so, on them? No way. Yeah, no, I, I know we, that's like the annual joke. I actually tallied them up the other day to see who I got to root for. I, I only got six teams still alive right now. That's that's a little lower than usual. Boston, Washington, the Islanders, Oh, the it's Kings, not that. I Jets, mean, they got, they got Philly, and then they got – that's at Philly. Then they go home back-to-back Seattle the next night. Then they got a day off. Then they got Van at home. So Horvat's going to play his ex-teammates in his third game. Day off at Montreal. Two days off. Ottawa, Pittsburgh, Boston, Pittsburgh, Winnipeg, L.A. Winnipeg Mini. So it's not exactly uh, that easy, Busy. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, I saw Seattle there. That's probably the toughest one like in that quick mix, though. And then Ottawa, Ottawa, Montreal, guaranteed wins. You got to win those if you got to fucking start mixing in a playoff position. So those are just those must wins where you might as well hammer them if you believe in them. True. I'll just uh, what's the emotional hedge as they call it? I got them. I got them beating a puck line money line tonight against the Flyers. I've already made the bet. So I'll be hate. I'll be hate betting them all day long. All right. All right, well, uh, shift from Bo Horvat to the weekend because it was pretty crazy. He was uh, elected to the All-Star game as a Vancouver Canuck, but obviously he is no longer with the team, so he still played for the Pacific with the Western jersey, but they had the Islanders patch on the shoulder. Did you guys happen to notice that? 
pretty pretty unique situation, right? He's never played for them, but he's, he can still be a Canuck. So they let him play in the same division with the Islanders uh, jersey, too. He had the Gortons Fisherman before he even played a game for them. But anyways, dialing it back, we made our annual trip to the All-Star game. It was nice to get out of the Northeast. It's cold as balls up here. Like you guys said, Florida. I mean, Fort Lauderdale buzzing all weekend. Everywhere you went, restaurants packed, like in Disco music coming out all over the place. What I was surprised with, too, was how many NHL alumni were down there. Every time you turned around, it was like, you know, Ray Whitney might be here. They look, there's another Hall of Famer around the corner. It seemed like a shitload of dudes came down just to get out of wherever they were. Well, yeah. I mean, it's fucking Florida. Yeah, Florida. They all get invited down. I believe Thursday night there was a wild cruise with uh, Wayne Gretzky, Mark Messier, Chelios, I believe. I think there was about 100 alumni on there. And so I, 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 I'm I, assuming that was a great time. Uh, I think that like if you can get more alumni involved and maybe pay these guys a little bit of money, come down. There was a big game. I think the Florida Panthers alumni Wednesday night played against the NHL alumni. So we saw Chris Chelios, who's obviously working for ESPN. Grinelli and I did. Paul Coffey was picking him up. I'm like, that's a pretty sick guy. To pay. That Uber driver won't steal your fucking phone. But uh, yeah, it's just an awesome place to have the all-star game now unfortunately the rink's in the middle of nowhere about 45 minutes from lauderdale i used to say like the coyotes if it wasn't in glendale and if it was in scottsdale it'd be unbelievable i think it's even more of a case of having if the rink was ever in lauderdale as opposed to sunrise it would be sold out to the max every single game but still an awesome place for the all-star game because nobody's going to pass up a chance to get down south Probably the reason why the lower apart. bowl wasn't really filled up for the like part of the skills competition because everybody who got dropped off had to do that 20-minute walk from the Uber. So everybody yep. missed the first 20 minutes of it. Are we going to get into the skills? Yeah, might as well jump into that I didn't see that one first. play. It, it, was, it was way too quiet in there, like you said, Biz. There, hardly any seats in the lower bowl were taken, but – I thought this might have been the first year the games were actually better than the skills Same. competition. But what was cool, though, they, all the guys out there, they had their reverse retros on. So that was pretty cool seeing every guy out there with this year's reverse retro jersey on. But, yeah, it was just they got to shake it up. I don't know what they what they can do going forward, like the stuff on the, the pitch and putt thing and then knocking the guys in the water. It was, all right, obviously a, a local tie to it. But I, I don't know how much longer they're going to keep doing this format, Biz, with, like, the tournament. I you said know, do it like medieval, uh, medieval times <laughs> dinner and tournament. And you got to get these little games going. Like, get away from, like, what they have, the goalie shooting it all the way down, like, to, to the other end. I mean, that doesn't really translate well to television. More like goals and, like, one, you know, three on two at one end when the defensive team finally gets the puck, they shoot it down the other tent, t- uh, end, which activates, like, that team's offense. You know what I'm saying? Like small, Oh, like the old drill we used to do? Yeah, like small area games and, and all of a sudden maybe it, like, elevates you on the power level on the, uh, you know, and through the crowd. You know, there's four different color shirts you wear when you when you walk in. So like you're you got to root for your team and maybe those sections win prizes and get somebody like I mean pay, PK hosted this one get PK hosting it again, do it this like I, cra- I, crazy Hunger Games medieval time style. That's not bad, um, I guess. And everybody's got to the- take shrooms before they come in. <laughs> <laughs> that'll, it's that'll there, really there's three events. The there's three events that With are the good. Three D goggles on. There's three events that are good. Fastest skater's great, accuracy shooting's great, and hardest shot's great. Those are the three kind of money makers that I think everyone enjoys, right? It's, seeing, it's great seeing how fast guys move. Uh, McDavid going out there and going four for four in eight seconds, even though I think Nel- Brock Nelson ended up winning it. That's cool. And then the hardest shot by Pedersen, that's always fun. After that, it is, it is like we're dogging it, or I was dogging it, but I'm also willing to say I don't, I don't know what to do. In terms of shrooms and then doing mini games, that's business world. We're all living in it. But I, I don't know, like, in terms of the game, Grinelli had a nice idea yeah. of somehow making it country versus country. Where, yeah, so like, I, I, pick- pitched that, I pitched that idea last year, yeah, and I, I, was telling every, I was telling everyone down there this year like about it. It's a three-on-three tournament. You bring the six or seven best guys from each country. You got to promote like the nationalism aspect of it because people are going to this game now, and there's, you're not rooting for anyone, right? Like you root for your guy that's there. Like I, I root for Pasternak. He's the Bruins guy, but I'm not going to root for the Atlantic division. But I'll tell you what, if the U.S. was in there, imagine like a U.S.-Russia game or a Sweden-Finland game. I'm a thousand percent going to root for that. I would be going crazy for that. So I think, I think they need to find a way to just ditch the divisions, bring in the nationalism aspect where each guy can represent his team, his country. And I think you do it like that. I mean, I'd be so, I, I don't know the number off my head. Like, how, how many uh, Canadians got invited to this year's All-Star team, though? 
So what if there's like too many good Canadian players where now what? You're only going to bring seven of them to the All-Star but game? That, but that's like the Olympics every year. It's like the Olympics could do – the Canada could have three teams in the Olympics every year, but they don't. You know what I mean? It's every four years. Yeah, every four years. But yeah, <laughs> Canada could have four teams in it every four years. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, to brand yeah, it better I, I, than what it is now, I, I mean, I wouldn't be – I wouldn't like argue not trying that. It's just I'd rather they do the World Cup of Hockey and keep that country oriented. And they should be doing that's, that. Every that's day. probably what they're looking at. But yeah. So anyway. I, I, now, here's the thing. Toronto got announced as the host of uh, next year's All-Star game. They'll do it probably. Um, and they have to, right? I mean, it's got, it, it, I think even the league probably knows this year, certainly the skills was kind of a dud and people were all over it. So going to Toronto in that market, they're going to have to try to get original and, and think of different ideas to really get this thing popping. Because if you thought the crowd wasn't filled like in, in, in Florida, I mean, sometimes the crowd isn't even filled at the beginning of periods for Leafs games. Yeah, so but I don't Justin really know. Bieber's already announced that he's going to be there and he's like probably going to oh, host really? it. So yeah, that'll be, that place will be packed okay. with the tits. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. As for the games on Saturday, the Central beat the Pacific 6-4. Atlantic beat the Metro 10-6. And then on the final, Atlantic beat Central 7-5. Did you have the uh, over on that game by any chance? With six goals in the last 137 of the game to go over. Unbelievable, yeah. I think it was like 10.5, depending on where you got in. You can bet the All-Star game? Yeah, you could bet all all three of them the other day. uh, Yeah, 12 goals in the last one. Like I said, over-under was 10.5. The Atlantic splits a million-dollar purse. How much do you think they... They each take out of that. Did they just like give it to like the locker room? A lot guys, of time they guys? give it to the locker room trainers. They just divvy it up and give it to those guys. Depends who who the guy like the captain is. Sometimes some of these young guys might not know and just be like, "Oh, sweet," and the check comes to their place. Or I don't know. I, I'd imagine they ain't coming in with a, a bag of money like the KHL, <laughs> unless, unless Gary's doing things <laughs> a little bit differently now. And a gun. Yeah, Matthew Kachuk won the MVP, had tons of family there. His old man, grandparents, was pretty cool to see. He had four goals, three assists on the day. He played in a line with his brother in uh, Bakoff. Pretty pretty good stuff. There were a lot of fun lines. I don't know if you guys saw much of the game, but it was, I thought it was way better on TV, which is usually the opposite. But it was fun to watch, man. There were some real good highlights. The goalies were trying their asses off. Did you think the final game was at least competitive? Yeah, I think so. And I, I thought it was cool to see Ovi and Sid going together. I know everyone really enjoyed that. Just two legends. And if you check out Chicklets, I mean, it's it's all over the place. But there's pictures of uh, Brady and Matthew Kachuk uh, flanking Sid. It must have been his rookie year. They're just these little kids. And then same with Ovi. And then they got the exact same picture this year. It's just wild to see how much the Kachuks have grown and how long Ovi and Sid have been dominating at this yeah. level and playing in the NHL. So really cool to see those guys getting together. I think Adam Fox got to be playing with them. Um, so the game, yeah, it was definitely better than the skills. And it was also cool. I think Kachuk got his hat trick goal, and there was they showed Big Walt in the crowd who gave like a big fist pump. He seemed really fired up. So awesome. I mean, seeing your two kids like playing together in the All-Star game, sure. are you kidding me? It's unbelievable. So it was really cool to just see these legends of the game getting together and then also seeing some high-level skills. So the game didn't disappoint. I don't think it was just the night before that was the bummer. Yeah, I, I bumped into Walt. I told him he won. He was in the All-Star 1996. It was the uh, same version of the jersey they wore this year. So it was his two sons had the, the same type of jersey he wore back on the day, which is pretty cool. All these years later, basically have the same jersey that they dusted off. Uh, he was the sixth player to win the MVP on home ice as well. Uh, Horvat, I mentioned earlier, him and Pedersen, you see they got together for a goal and they fucking challenged the goal in the fucking All-Star game and they took it down off the board. So then they ended up getting back together, How fitting. scored a goal after that. It was pretty but cool. But if you talk that. about gambling, it's like, you kind of have to do that. I know it sounds a little ridiculous, but when it when it when it when when the league is open and advertising MGM with McDavid and Gretzky, it's like you 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 have to play by the rules. I'm not arguing with you. I just what am I it, fucking? No, no. I I just thought it was my fitting. Name, Skip. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was fitting, given how we've been bitching about all these uh, these goal reversals and, and and even the fact that you're able to challenge. I think they should rid with them as well as the TV timeouts. I'm willing to uh, to settle on one TV timeout, and we're going to get to much of this conversation later because it's Gary Bettman's 30th anniversary as commissioner of the league, and we're going to go over maybe some of his blunders, things that he's done well for the league. And I'm really interested to get your guys' thoughts on all that. 
Absolutely, but getting that in a little bit. Uh, there were only six defensemen. Did you notice that? Of the four teams, they had uh, Jones, Morrissey, McCaw, Darlene, Fox, and Carlson. And then there was a TV timeout delay biz. The fucking m- mascots and their furry buddies, they shot the confetti. It got all over the ice. They had to actually take like a five-minute timeout to wipe all that shit off. I didn't even know if you, if you noticed it in the arena because it was so quiet during the games. I caught it on TV, though. Fucking gritty in the middle of it once again. All right, just to, to, I don't know if you're going to move on from the All-Star game here, but we will have a vlog coming out recapping our whole All-Star game event experience the whole weekend. That's going to be on the Chicklets YouTube page uh, next Wednesday, not this upcoming Wednesday, next Wednesday. Yeah, G, I think that about wraps it up for the All-Star game. We could probably move on right about now and uh, probably send it over to Rod Brindamore, Carolina Hurricanes head coach. We sat down with him for about 45 minutes the other day, talked about his career on the ice and behind the bench. It's good shit, so... Going to send it over to Hot Rod right now. This interview is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the exclusive ticketing partner of Barstool Sports. They crack the code on how to score deals on last-minute tickets. And right now, Game Time has a special offer for the big game. All users, not just first-time users, can get $100 off their big game ticket purchase with the code BASTOOL100. Gang, I talk about game time all the time, but I'm trying to get Red Sox tickets, Bees tickets, concerts like Hootie and the Blowfish down in Carolina soon. Can't wait. You save 100 bucks, boom. How many more? Pretzels, hot dogs, brewskis, whatever you want at the game, or shop or concert, whatever you're doing, boom, 100 bucks in your pocket. Unreal deal. So download the Game Time app or go to the web- website, enter your email, redeem the code CHICKLETS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. And if you are going to the big game, get $100 off your purchase with the code BASTOOL100, even if you've bought tickets with game time before. Spend that 100 elsewhere. Gee, you must be catching some good stuff down the city lately. All right, I actually have been. So there is a good chance, I've mentioned this on Chicklets Game Notes, that I could be moving to New Jersey soon. If that's the case, this Jack Hughes is having an unbelievable season, and game time is going to help me get in the door in Newark to see the Devils, to see Jack Hughes. Hopefully I can mix in a Bruins game when they come see uh, when they come to Newark. But again, it's only because of game time. Game time is the best. And like you said, download the game time app or go to the website, enter your email, and redeem code Chicklets for $20 off your purchase. Terms apply. And don't forget, 100 bucks off if you get a ticket for the big game with the code BASTOOL100. Enjoy. <laughs> We're happy to welcome our next guest to the show. During a 20-year NHL career totaling nearly 1,300 games with St. Louis, Philly, and Carolina, he won two Selkie trophies and the 2006 Stanley Cup. He's now currently in his fifth season coaching the Hurricanes where he's won a Jack Adams trophy, and he'll be coaching the Metropolitan Division here at All-Star Weekend in Florida. It's a pleasure to welcome to the Spittin' Chicklets podcast, Rod Brindamore. All right, you you read that pretty well. Yeah, a little second time. (laughs) My pleasure, pal. Is it not over 1,400 games? I thought it was close to 1,500 already. You said almost 1,300. It it depends how you look at it. Regular season. (laughs) I know know the number total is 1,637 playoffs because that's my code on my computer oh fuck so, so somebody's gonna be that. hot hacking in your no, iCloud no. now <laughs> oh I, yep i screwed up the math yep it, it's only 1300 yeah so check made on me sorry dash one dash one. turnover that's okay all not right. the start rod the bot no, wants no he's, gonna, he's gonna cut me how's the week am i going anyway so far enjoying it i've had i probably had the best because i just showed up here last late late last night because oh, really? my uh, i got i got a young son i got 11 year old plays hockey so i was in dallas a lot yesterday they have a tournament there, so I coached two games, got on a plane during the skills thing, watched it on the airplane, while I, and then flew here. So they were nice enough to leave to let me miss that so I could be with my son. So that was actually – I give them kudos for that. You know, Not that I need to be here at all, really, but – they let me you, you a pass. Are, are you as intense? You didn't with miss your, much. Are you as intense with your kid as you are with your? You hear your my voice? <laughs> it's, I, I yeah, it's worse because I'm just you know it's it's great because I you know I coach the big boys and then I get to coach the little guys but it's hard to switch it right. <laughs> So I'm just going, what are you doing? Get out on the porch. You know, like I'm screaming at the 11 year olds. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like, uh, Ron, you know, it's, uh, uh, not the Flyers we're playing against. Yeah. So anyway, it's fun though. So we like to start off a guy's career. Like you're, You've been known as a Mr. Intensity guy, the v- stories of locking the gym at Ma- Michigan State. Is that something that was innate in you or, what, was it from watching your parents growing up? Like how did you get yeah. that drive at such a young age? Well, it's exactly what you just said. So at 12 years old, my dad was a pipe fitter. You know, like, I mean, 6 a.m., put the overalls on. Just grinding. Just grinding. And you see that as a kid every day. I don't know what – and then, I mean, just to get by, you know, put food on the table. And 
I remember him, and it was him or something. He said, look, if you want to – I, I want to play in the NHL like everybody, right? I mean, everyone – we're playing hockey. I grew up in Canada. He said, you want to get to the, here? You got to do more than the, the buddy sitting beside you, the, the neighbor across the street. You're going to the practice with he is. You're doing this, but how are you getting any better? So he buys me the cheap plastic, you know, Wydell weights. You remember those things that had the sand in them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, you – Anyway, uh, maybe, maybe a little before my time. Okay, well, yeah, you probably had the real stuff, but I had the. <laughs> I mean, so and he's like, so six a.m. He cranks his car up. That was my wake up. So I go downstairs, and I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm 12 years old. I'm starting to play with this stuff. 20 minutes before school, 20 minutes after school. That was so just, and then it was just every day. I'm like, okay, how do you get better? Like, am I getting better than the next guy? Well, I gotta do. I know what he's doing. I got. I got to do a little more. Wow. So, so that's just kind of kept with me the, my whole life, my whole certainly through my career. And I don't know if it helped, hurt, I don't know, but it, it's, you know, it got me through it anyway. Oh, so I think no, it helped. No alarm, 6 a.m. every day, you're up. Well, yeah, well, that's a curse too now, right? Because, yeah, so, you know, I mean, I'm not like you guys. Like, if I go to bed at 2, I'm, I'm up at 6. You know, I can't be, I don't get So the sleep. road kind of must crush you on, on the well, it is NHL trail. Totally. Travel. When you get home at, like, 2 in the morning, it's, no, but, you, you know, it is what it is. There's, you get, you find time to yeah. sleep. So, so did you... Like you were training yourself then at 12, yep. you didn't really know what you're doing. Did you always train yourself? Yeah. Like, so, so that's what now, I mean, these guys, like, they don't know how good they got it. We got pay a full big time, money for trainers. Big money for trainers, but we've got a, the best strength coach in the league. And he sits there all summer. Like, he's there all day. And he just, these guys, you know, if they want to come in. And they, they don't, I'm like, this is unreal. You know, we had to find a gym. You know, and then yeah. get in there, find some ice time. Now they got ice set for these guys whenever you need. It. Like, it, most, I mean, most of the guys stay in town then to train. We don't, we don't have we have a few because we're older. We're getting older now, so guys that like the school starts right for their kids, so they come back. We have a couple full time guys that live there, but um, we just have you know, our owner came in. We had a new owner. Did he's phenomenal because he he's taking care of the players and new facility. You know, I mean, so it's state of the art. So guys like to be there. And obviously we got good people working and it's, it's taken off as you can tell. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, how did you end up at Michigan State as opposed to playing at juniors? A lot of Canadian kids were still Yeah, so still I went home. to the, uh, uh, Notre Dame, which is in Wilcox, Saskatchewan, which is in the middle of nowhere, which is one of the, was at the time, I mean, the best prep school for kids to play hockey. I mean, just all you did was school, workout, play hockey and they had great coaching Barry McKenzie is one of the best coaches that's ever been around he's he's long since retired but over 150 NHL players have gone Always through this go take a look at it's like look, Shattuck for it's for, Shattuck yeah, okay. for 100% but it, it's it's higher it's better because well, you went there if you know if you just look at what's turned out I mean it's amazing people I'm telling you you got to do the math and like, go look it's it, he's just it was a great coach anyway so I'm going through that and everyone at Notre Dame it's about going to college so, right, I, all right, I mean, I'm, that's what I'm doing. And listen, I, the college game for me is, is, is phenomenal. It's the best, best like, avenue for kids that aren't Sidney Crosby. I, yeah, I agree. Right? If you're Sidney Crosby, you're going to go to junior hockey because you're going to play as an 18-year-old in the NHL. But if you're not, it gives you four more years to develop your game, maybe figure it out. If not, number one, you're knocking schooling out, but you're having the time of your life. And you spent your one life. year there. I spent <laughs> one year there, but no, listen, I went back for four summers and <laughs> went to school, to classes, but all my buddies were there as freshmen, right? So we, named Jim Cummins and Jason Woolley, Mazzotti, like these are my guys that when I was there, you know, and we're still great friends. I mean, you know. Ron, college, Ron Mason was there. Ron Mason, great coach. Yeah. Um, Newell Brown, who's still coaching the oh, NHL, yeah, still assistant going. was there at Phenomenal. He was the recruiter. It was a right? great guy. Great guy. So it's like, anyway, it was. It's the best avenue. My son, my oldest son, plays college hockey at Quinnipiac right now. And they're oh, doing they got really a hell of well. a team. They're doing good. They're they're they want to beat Harvard last night, like, and he. I mean, he's his fourth year now. He's senior, but uh, this it's a great avenue for kids. I mean, he's just figuring out now. And yeah. if he was a junior kid, he, he's out of hockey. Yeah, you know? exactly. He's twenty three now, but I think he's got a chance. You know now because he's figured it out he's in the gym all the time like all of a sudden you get a lot stronger in college yeah. that is the one and thing. the game in college now all the guys are older yeah. so you got even though your top kids are coming in north dakotas and this they're 18 they're playing against 23 year olds over at the other places the game has gotten it's so almost, much it's better a, it's almost older than the american league now <laughs> it's becoming a minor league yeah. i'm telling you and, yeah. and then you can get a lot of good kids out of college that at 18 no one knew who they were 
and they give him gives him a second life. Well, you had that you know that amazing freshman year. You know, I think sixty points, and and you turned pro right after the season. You went to the playoffs, scored a goal on your first shot, yeah. in your first yeah. ever it's playoff amazing, game. Right opportunity. Easy so game. you get no oh, wow, it's a tap in, right? A rebound, but jump. Okay. I, I scored my first two shots. So the next, <laughs> listen, the next series that was a, we we were playing Minnesota. Mike Madonna, we just we both signed at the same time. We come in, and he didn't play. I don't even know if he played that series, but he was there. Because I remember we were sitting out the first four games of the series in Minnesota. We both signed. We're standing in the, in the stands together, sitting there. So anyway, I get in the last game, in, in game five, and I score my first shot. Okay, good. So now we go to play Chicago, second round. How great was that old we Start building. the game. It starts me. Seven seconds into the game. Boom, it's in the net. I score. <laughs> so now they think I'm like, right. they think, oh, this kid is it. And I was, it was just luck, right? It's just, but now I'm in. I, and, and, you know, but, and actually the next game, it didn't have review back then. My third shot went in too. It was in the, under the bar and out and, you know, no review back then. So I'm, I should have had three for three, <laughs> you know, and then it went downhill after that. But, yeah, uh, you know, anyway, I was in. You know what I mean? Now yeah. next year, I, don't, I come to training camp. I'm still, I'm 19. But this guy, oh, he knows He's how to play. In the playoffs. And they put me with Adam Oates, right, oh, wow. as a rookie. Are you kidding? So, I mean, what a way to get started. But if I don't score, I don't just – look like I know what I'm doing I wonder what happens you know yeah so it's just everyone you get that opportunity you gotta you well know, as a coach work. now you call up a kid from the minors he scores for a shift you're like go back out there yeah right? well exactly you know make a good impression so your first two years were with St. Louis now those are the two years Brett Hall scored 72 then oh, 86 yeah. well he must have really been feeling himself back in those days huh <laughs> so that was the good hockey right like the not being good hockey. it was like the good times I mean I, I Old school. I mean, Brett Hall ran the show. It, it was, it's amazing. We, we all have no Brett Hall stories. I mean, the guy was phenomenal, but hard to play with. Like, if you were, oh, yeah, I mean, he'd look too, down right? at you and be like, especially and, as a rookie. Oh, my God. I, I had to play to with him. Wire so, passes across listen, the listen, My second year, okay, after playing with Adam Oates, my first year, I have a great year. They put me at center and started me with Brett Hall on my wing for about five games that lasted, maybe. And Holly would come off the bench, and he'd, I'd be sitting right beside him, and he'd look back at Sutter, as I coach, get this guy off my line. Oh, that's the worst. You know, and I'm just sitting there, I'm, like, I'm like, oh, I'm trying my you know, hardest here, but I just can't do it. And, yeah. and then after the game, he'd pat you on the back and take you out, and you know, he's the best guy. But, man, it was just so stressful. Oh, man. Like, Brett, you called me a piece of shit an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. But he was the greatest guy. You know him. I mean, he's... Oh. It, off the edge, it was phenomenal, but it was really hard to play with. So they put him back with Adam Oates and the rest of his history, right? Like, I mean, Oates, he could handle him. Wow. And then, so I was reading that they, they lost Scott Stevens because of the compensation with, like, the Brennan Shannon, and then they, they had to get a defenseman, and so you got moved. But you must have been shocked, right? You know, so this is crazy hockey back then. This would never go on today. So they make an offer sheet for Brennan Shanahan. They offer myself and Curtis Joseph as compensation, Okay. To the arbitrator, pretty good, I think. It would have worked probably pretty good for, for them. But the arbitrator says, no, that's not enough. They give him Scott Stevens. So myself and Curtis are sitting here. I'm at a, We're at a golf tournament. Listen to this. The charity golf tournament for the St. Louis Blues. This is back in the day. They, they want me to do an interview that I got traded and one that the arbitrator didn't. So I'm doing it before and after. So I got to do, <laughs> oh, I hate that I got let, moved. And then I'm real happy to be here. And they're going to put takes. one on at, at, when the decision TV. comes on. Yeah. It was unbelievable. So, Imagine that hitting Twitter now. Oh, no, yeah. I'm <laughs> telling you. Both. So, but now I'm a sitting duck, right? Uh, they're supposed to move. They thought for sure that was going to happen. And then that's what you know precipitated me getting traded to Philadelphia. Yeah, and you spent a good good chunk of time in Philadelphia. You played with uh, Lindros, the whole Legion of Doom line. Uh, what was up with that? Seven, yeah, the 97 finals. You guys rolled all the way to the finals. Then Detroit just kind yeah. of had their way with wow. you. Wow. Look at Detroit, yeah. right? <laughs> no, no, so we're a young team in Philadelphia. I mean, myself, I'm still pretty young at the time, 26. Lynn Russ, 22, maybe three. You know, we had, uh, I mean, LeClaire. We, we're Desjardins. We're, we're just coming young. along. Yeah, we, we're just getting going. And we blow through the playoffs like it's your job. I mean, I don't even, I, I never had an easier three rounds. Just, okay. And then you hit Detroit, and it was like, uh-oh. We didn't know what hit us. And so we lose in, what, four or five? I don't know what it was. It was, it was quick. The mistake the Flyers made then was – Oh, we got to get a bunch of new players. Mm -mm. Let us figure it out. Yeah, you know we we're hungry as a group, but now we flip in a whole bunch of new guys. It doesn't work. Crazy. So they kind of not panic, but like got, got to the cup final and didn't think it was enough. Yeah. I remember talking to John Leclaire, and he was telling me about that run. Like their line, at least, 
guys would try to play him physical. And then it was Lidstrom, Murphy, and the whole Detroit team. It was just stick work. It wasn't even physicality. It was, it was, they, we got schooled. And you knew it. I, I mean, you knew when you're out there, man, what, like, we're wanting a brick wall here. And we're trying. We're doing everything we can. I mean, I think we, we fired our coach after that series, right? Think about that. We get all the way through and because we, we look so bad, but it, it had nothing to do with coaching. I mean, they were better. And we had good players. I know, I, I, in my heart, I feel if we would have kept that group together. We would have got one. We, we would have figured, because you know, now you know, okay, wait a minute, there's another level to get to. And you know what it is. You got you to gotta do it together. Now you bring in a couple of new guys. They didn't know what we just went through. They didn't know how hard we had to work and what you know, we ran into. And then it just kind of went sideways there. And all. you saw, I mean, we won't go to Carolina yet, but in that instance, you, you lost in 2 and you figured it out and three years later, right? So it's kind well, of those, it, those... It, it, You're right. Right. I mean, Detroit in 02 was even the same. I mean, we're back then. Now, now we're, we're the little engine. We got a $38 million payroll. They got a $75 million payroll. There was no chance. Right? That's what it was. That was the difference. Yeah. yeah. The, and they all had four lines and all Hall of Famer. I mean, yeah. I mean, we won the first game. And then we actually had game three in the bag. Oh, was that game three? And, you know, they scored the minute to go or whatever. And then it goes forever on in overtime. I mean, that could flip it if we easily get maybe. But they're probably still going out, you know. So b back to Philly. I mean, they're going through it right now, obviously. But that fan base, they just yeah. love guys who grind, that work totally. their balls off. So, I mean, you must have loved it. You fit right in. Loved they, they loved you. Like Listen, when they traded me, it was one of the worst days of my life. No way. Worst day of my life. I, I was crushed. And it took me, I took me a, year, a couple of years to get over it. Because I was like, I'm doing everything. I'm a flyer. Right? I mean, I'm, I live there. I'm take all the young guy i go train i'm showing how we do this you know what i mean i'm mean, like you felt they gave up on i you? mean no i just it's just you know i, I want to be here the rest of my career and and i just thought i, I was gonna be why, why would you trade me i'm doing everything you, you need me to do and, and the kiss of death i mean i could probably tell the story now because it's 20 years ago or 30 years ago and whatever but i had broken my foot okay and i'm out for i don't know half the year first time i've i played almost 500 games in a row and then in yeah. a preseason game that I shouldn't have been playing in. It was back in when we used to play three and three, and you, they didn't have rules, so I, they made me play the third one, and I'm in New <laughs> Jersey, and take one off the foot. And So anyway, long story short. But anyway, I get, I get uh, called into the office in November, and I'm like, I've never been called into the office. And you're not even playing. I'm not even playing. And I'm like, this is weird. So I go in there, Homer's, Homer's there, and Clark, he's not in yet, but he, Homer's the assistant GM. What do you think of uh, Keith Primo? No way. So I played with Prems in the Olympics, uh, in the World Cup, sorry. And so I go, great guy. I love him. Why? He goes, well, he's holding out in Carolina, and we got to, you know, they want to make a deal. What do you think? And I go, well, are, you, are you talking about me? He goes, no, no, no. We would never trade you. <laughs> I, he goes, and he names off the players that they were trying to get, right? Lindros, you know what I mean? It was – and a whole cast of the other guys. I go, I would never do that deal. I go, Lindros is too good. You know, you can't get rid of him. So I go, and as I'm leaving, I go, Homer. I go, he goes, no, nah, man, Clarky thinks too much of you. And we won't, the deal is off. We won't make the deal or whatever. So I walk out, I go home, I go, pack my, you know. I go, you I know. Well, I, I've been there eight years and they've never once, I mean, rumors all every year about me getting traded. Because I was just, you know, I was a good player, and you know, it's just how it goes. And now it's the first time he's called me in to say I'm not gonna trade. I said, "Back my shit." So I got healthy. I, I played three games, and then I was the guy shipped to. Oh, so when he uh, called, when when Clarky called and told you, were you? I mean, you know, you said you're devastated. Did you almost like say anything back to him, or was nah, it just? I don't even think he called me. It was uh, I got I, I was in Pittsburgh. We're playing the Penguins, and then and I get the call. You know, the call in the afternoon in the hotels that you you know is the bullshit because you got do not disturbs on and then okay where am i going and it was paul maurice okay you got a 230 flight and i had i had a one i had a one game one you know night overnight bag right because i'm going back to philly. he goes we'll fly in you play the game and you go home back to philly get your shit and come back so we go there play the game and there's snowstorm of the century in north carolina shut down the city for two weeks i had one bag i had no, no clothes and, I, and i'm stuck in a hotel they canceled <laughs> games it was like go it was like three teams stuck in raleigh for like a week it was just a nightmare and I'm, this is my introduction to 
Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm like, this is brutal. And there's 8,000 fans in the game. Oh, my God. And I never realized, because I played Philadelphia, it was packed. It's packed. It's awesome, the environment. I never realized what that does to you. So I get in, and I'm like, are we in practice? Is this a practice? I'm like, you know what practice is? I'm like, juices how do I get I'm fired like, up? I'm like, I know. holy shit. Like, oh, this is, this is weird. You know, it's just, and that's how it kind of started. And I'm like, oh, boy. But the one thing I didn't notice immediately how great the people were down there. Phenomenal. So I, I'm, I'm dragging on here. But no, no. I get there stuck for two weeks, or it was a week in the hotel. There's no food. I'm, I'm, what am I going to do? So I go to the grocery store. I walk there in a suit. It's snowing. I got no overcoat. The people were lined up outside to get into the get bread and get. They see me coming. And who's this guy? They didn't know who I was. No one had a clue about hockey. And because I, I'm not dressed right, you know, they were like, this guy can't wait outside. Push me into the front of the line. Go in and go get some food. Would wow. that happen? That wouldn't happen in Philadelphia. <laughs> You'd be back in line, <laughs> no, buddy. They would have thrown you a know? snowball off your forehead. <laughs> you know, even if they knew you, who you were. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I was like, this is interesting. Anyway, I've been there 23 years now. Yeah, like this guy's had the same suit for six days. We better get him in the store. <laughs> yeah. Everybody. Oh, I want to yeah. go back to Lindros for a second. Have you yeah. ever played with a guy who was that dominant when you no. played with Lindros no. ever since? This is ridiculous. Yeah. Ridiculous. Just such a just strong... I mean, he could shoot a puck with one hand. You know, he'd come down the wing and just boom, and you'd be like, "Damn, that's that's like I don't even know if I can shoot it." But two hands that hard, and he could run you over, he could fight you, he could dangle you, he could pass it. You know, phenomenal player, right? It's too bad he had the, you know, the injuries because you know his career had been so much better. Cockies. Yeah, like like yeah. when 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 he was going through that, like what, like what was it like at the locker room? Was it kind of a- well? It was funny. I had probably. It, 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 I had moved on because right, right when he got the bad ones there at the end. That I, was like 2000, right? It, it, I got traded in January 2000, and then that was the playoff year that he got. And then it's kind of – so I didn't really – I didn't get any of it when I was with him. I had a good, I think, seven years with him. Man, nothing but good things to say. He competed his ass off. Yeah. I mean, we were we were coming. And I told you that we made some sideways moves. And it's, it's I mean, they tried to be do the right thing. I just think had they just stuck with that group it would have been better because he was he was legit one of the best players to ever play. What was was Bob Clark back? Was he coming down and like giving it to guys sometimes? Because I felt like he was Clarkie really involved. Was awesome. right? I love Clarky. No, you know what? He he was probably back then maybe fifty or forty five as a GM. You know, started he'd come down one day full gear, <laughs> comes out, let's go face offs, starts teaching us. The tricks of the trade, the tricks, to yeah. little things. I'm like, damn, this is good. And he, he, you know, he was always there to help you. Yeah. But he actually wasn't. Like, he never got in your stuff. You know what I mean? Just, but little things he'd see come down. But I, I'll never forget that. There he is, the GM coming down, full <laughs> gear. Come here. I'm gonna show you. Something. So like the legendary stories going back to Michigan State of you getting locked out of the weight room. Like when you got pro, were coaches also like Rod? You gotta just relax a little bit. You got maybe maybe, yeah. you're, maybe you're working on a little too much. Like, yeah, Brian Sutter in St. Louis right away was like. You what was your post game? Well, back then they didn't even have gyms, so I get to St. Louis and there's not even a there's not even a gym. There's like a there's nothing. I mean, there's like a little one of those pull down machines that's like rusted out monarch and a monarch that's the ribbons busted on it you know i'm like what, what are we doing here so we went to a local gym at like myself there was like a couple of hardcore guys that were into it and i think gino cavallini showed me like here we, we can go to this gym so after practice we'd be like shower up and then go over to the gym i mean we were this is you imagine guys doing that today oh they wouldn't imagine no, holly doing do it, it then. no well they holly didn't it. holly didn't do that but, <laughs> but i mean there was a few of us you know but uh it was just so different you know uh, i don't remember your question now no Side i was talking track. about coaches well, you, you, how much you worked out and coaches maybe yeah, saying it's so too much as he calls me in and goes i don't know I mean, he was hardcore brian sutter but i think it was great coach to have as a young kid because I, I think this is how the NHL is. Like, you're not allowed to smile in pregame. Pregame skate. Like, I'm not, what are you cracking a smile for? You know? Okay, game's at seven. I mean, you know, and Holly's up there laughing his ass off. What? Like, you know, like, but like, you know, Same if you screw up. Apply. No, exactly. But it was like, you can't screw up. So he calls me in. I'll never forget this. In his office, he's like, I can end your career. I'm like, what? Because I, I can put you in the minors right now. Leave you down there. You got to do it this way. He wanted me. To, he had a vision of me being more like Cam Neely, and I'm like, 
I, I'm, I'm, I, I think I can do it a little differently. You know, like, I mean, I, he's fucking Cam Neely. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't really want to be doing that. <laughs> you know, I got a little different. I'm a, I want to play center. I'm, you know, I know I'm big, but it's just, you got to have it up here to be like that, you yeah, know? exactly. And that's just, I don't think you put that into somebody, you know? So, I mean, I can handle myself. If you grab me, I know what I'm doing, but I'm not really, that's not my thing. So he was like, no, you're going to be like, because my one mistake I probably made was one of my first games, too, in the playoffs. I fought, I think, uh, McGill and did all right. You know what so I mean? So he's like, oh, yeah. There. And then uh, I, my first fight was actually against Mike Madonna. So he fight, he wants to fight me. You got to look this one up. And I two punched and broke his nose into the – and so now, like, they think, though, this guy's the killer. Throw, but I'm like, no, that, most of them probably thought I was just going to hold on to <laughs> he him. He thought he was a college guy. You know, yeah. So anyway, that part of it, it was just, I'm like, now every day I'm like, I come to the rink, it's all business. Yeah. You know, which was, I'm glad I moved on. And then I went to Philly and Homer was there. It's the same thing at the start. Like, Paul Homer is like, you want to see a guy that can Whoa. rip your head off. Like, you know, so I'm like, okay, this is the NHL. And then. It, you know, I realized as coaches came, away, right, you're allowed to have fun here. But it was great to start that way, like, boom, business, you know? Well, it's like, I mean, back then when you were playing, there was no guys shooting the shit before a face-off. Now it, it's no. all the time. We call it, it must sticks. still drive you nuts once guys in a while. In yeah, Biz calls them tummy sticks. Guys in warm-up, hey, what's up, buddy? Yeah. Save yeah. it for after the game. Yeah, the I'm way. with you on that. But I've lightened up big time. Yeah. Because you have to. These guys now, they, they don't know any other way. It's not really fair to go – you know what I mean? If the, if you're brought up, what did you say? Tell me. Tell did, me you, did you ever go home I mean, and say, yeah, maybe I was a little too hard on that guy? No, because now I'm I'm I get where they're coming from. I don't think I'm too hard at all. I'm not anything like those coaches I just mentioned. I mean, that's just not how my style. But I get. Listen, we brought them up this way. The kids now, they're, they're you got to understand that you do something like that now, and they look at you like. You, what are you doing? You're you not, you have no chance. You got no chance. Yeah, the yelling yeah. and screaming, it doesn't work anymore. With no, I mean, kids. I still yell and scream, but it's <laughs> it's what how you say it and when you do it, I think, you know. Yeah, I want to go actually back to the 06 Cup. Now, you guys had a 3-1 series lead. Probably, I, we always say on the show, one of the best Stanley Cups ever versus Edmonton. Now, you guys almost blew a 3-1 lead. Before third period of Game 7, did you give a big speech to the locker room? After Game 6... We got pounded in Edmonton. That was the worst game. It was like 5-1, which was the best thing to happen. We lost game five in overtime. Pisani. So we're like in the locker room. I mean, we're winning the cup here. We're on a power play going into overtime. Oh, my God. Game five to win the Stanley Cup. Been waiting this my whole life. My whole, Like, this is, here we go. How are we going to put this way? And boom, we get up a short hander. To no. lose. And now I got to get on a plane and go to Edmonton for game six. I am losing my shit. Like, I can't believe that this just happened. And – so we get pounded in game six. It was not even close. Best thing happened because we weren't in the game. So now you can flush it. That game five sat with us through game six. Yeah. We're like, we had the cup, man. We had the cup. I can't believe it, you know. So now that game was just, okay, easy to forget. And now it's, it was like a weight came off on my shoulders. I'll never forget it going into game seven because I know it's over. This is, this it. is it. There's no, I don't have a game eight. I don't have, it's, it, this is it. And, and we just, we played a good game and, you know, we were the better team. I really felt that. I we mean, uh, we had Andre Roy on the podcast, and I think they lost a very important playoff game. And he ended they up lost like, in Calgary. And then they ended, he ended up gearing down on the plane to break the ice, and ended up going down. And his ass cheeks were hanging out like through the aisle. Was there anyone in the in the room who really loosened things up? Well, well, Wit was our guy, Ray Whitney. Oh yeah, yeah. you know he I is the best. Wizard, yeah. I mean, he's he's one of the most underrated hockey players oh. that ever played the game. Just so you, know, I'll put that out there. I'll put him up with anyone make plays see vision but also really good dude like funny so wow. he was our guy that would lighten the mood all the time i can't really tell you those things he would do but <laughs> there, there was some there was some inappropriate things that went on um to lighten the mood for sure hey, that team because i played with mark recce that year yeah. and you guys picked him up i mean what a big addition and there was totally. doug wade it was like so many veterans on that club yeah. to help to help you totally. right with the leadership totally. we were an old team like it, and i i you knew i mean i can look back now we knew we were gonna win but when you go down the list like guys and you're looking around like i, I sat with glenn wesley on the plane for ever for years and he'd never won and he's been i mean the, he went through some bad injuries right we he grinded it out and i'm looking brett hedekin sitting there you know and you just mentioned when I mean, rex had won yeah. but but wait oh, right? dougie's not won nothing you know and i got you know and we got some young guys um coming up eric cole sitting there he got hurt 
Well, but he Ward wanted to come goalie, back. Right? Well, well, he wasn't. See, we had Gerber. Martin Gerber came in a whole year. It was the best goaltending year I've been I've seen. I've been around in my time as far as what he did. And then in the playoffs came, he had a little hiccup. And he, he got yanked in the Montreal series. They put Cam in, and Cam won the series. And then they took Cam went for a little hiccup. They put Martin Gerber back in for a game in the Buffalo series. People forget this. And then he got a shutout in Buffalo. And then he played the next game, and it wasn't so good. So they went back to Cam. And then Cam played the rest of the Buffalo series and Edmonton. So, but Gerber was the, actually our goalie all year. Cam just kind of came in, and, but young kid. And he didn't have any fear. But we had all these old guys mixed in with these younger guys, and it was just a perfect mix. And you just, you kind of knew, like, like Witt was an older guy at the time, not super old, but been around. You just, we're not going to lose. Like, this is our last chance. Like, yeah. we're putting it all out here. And, it, you know, obviously you say that now because it, it worked out, but that's it, how it felt. It, it, it's just amazing to, because we were at a game this year, you guys pounded Edmonton in, in Carolina. The atmosphere, we talked about it on the pod. Like, it's back. And you're mentioning you were there, there's nobody there. And then all of a sudden, game seven, you're lifting the cup and it's turned into one of the best atmospheres Dude, in the NHL. It, it is, I mean, I know I'm biased, but I did say it was brutal when I got there. Yeah. It, it the, the atmosphere there, and we were we're I, uh, this whole year we've had unbelievable crowds. I don't know if we've had sellouts every year, but I don't see any empty seats. And but it's they don't sit on their hands like they enjoy the game and it's yeah, loud. It's a party. And like it there. is, it is awesome. So it's a great environment and it's 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 a great story. I mean, we're rooted now. It's twenty five years of whatever been there. It's not a new thing anymore. These kids have grown up with the Carolina Hurricanes and and it's you know it's a small town. Like it's a small market. That's just what it. But I mean, the fact that we're supported this well and, um, and the atmosphere is awesome. I, I think it's a great entertainment value when you come watch us there, and they, they appreciate that. I mean, we have a good team. We try to play a style that's fun to watch. Yeah. And the fans and the players have kind of got us a little unique thing going, and I know the surge thing, the people like it. Like, I, no matter to me what you think because the fans like it. Mm. And when they first told you it was going down, were you like, what the No, fuck? no, see, this is – I'll set this record straight here. I came up – with to Justin Williams in the summer, I said Willie, we got to do we we my first year coach. I said Willie, we got to do something here for the people, and I I'm just gonna give you a little idea here or something. When I, I during the lockout, back in whenever the hell that was, I had I went over to Switzerland, and when when Gary cut the season off, I got on a plane, went over and played for a month in uh, Cloton, and I go they did this thing after the game, and I thought it was hilarious, right? They they get together. I don't know what's going on. And they ran that after they jump into the stands and the crowd's all going bananas. I said, this is hilarious. He goes, oh, all right. Boom. Then he got the guys together and they took this thing and did it. And that year was phenomenal. You know, so it was, I'm all for it because it's not about, the whole idea of it was the cameras are off. The game's over. We don't, no one thought, okay, the cameras are going to keep rolling and make it a big deal. And they, they didn't, by the way. This the, It only became a story halfway through the year, but it had been going on the whole time. Do you know I, what I mean? I love how it was your idea, though, but then one game you probably looked and saw them bowling Martinook down the middle, and you're <laughs> like, what, what is this turned into? Nah, it's fun. It was good, though. They were having fun. Listen, we've had Holyfield came into our room, and then he goes, man, he didn't know anything about hockey, and did a little speech for us, and then he's like, I'll go out there. and You know, they just – having a good time I, I just think it's pretty cool and i mean now this year they've they've kind of toned it down and they just you know run into the glass or whatever i don't even really know because i don't really watch what's going on after but the fans still stick around and you know it's for them it's yeah. not for anyone else uh back to that cup i mean i think it's like when i think of it it's you and chara in terms of when you're lifting it it's two of the most emotional coolest celebrations of lifting and i mean i can't imagine what, what went through your head and what you you know went through to get there right at that moment well you know it, listen as a kid that's all i dream i didn't dream about making a hall of fame i didn't dream about you know anything but that's what i dreamt about like literally every day i was like i want to i want to host hoist that thing and i want to be the first guy to hoist it you know what i mean like i want it like and to actually be going holy shit this is going to happen you know what I mean? I can't. I still got goosebumps thinking about it. Like I'm like, and I everyone kind of gives me grief. Oh, you took it from Gary. I go. I couldn't hear what was going on. You know what I mean? It was so loud in there, and I just saw him kind of pull. I'm like, this is my. I mean, you know, like I've been Give waiting forever. Me. You know, and it's still one of the. It is the greatest day of my life. I mean, it, it just being real. I mean, that's you can't beat that. I wish everybody could experience that because it was, 
you lived your dream. It sit, it just sit there all your days training, everything you were thinking about was like for here, and it and it paid off, right? Yeah. So not everybody gets that. Oh no, none of us did, except for RAs lifted it like six times. <laughs> um, <laughs> as a captain and a leader, were you a guy? Were you calling guys out when they needed to be called out? Were you, were you, were you more quiet? Like how did that go about? Yeah, I'm. I was. I never. I, I was not a rah rah guy, and I, I kind of always try to pick my spots you know i remember watching i mean you take everything i remember i played for a long time before i got to carolina i was 35 year old captain first time so i'd seen and you know some guys that were good and some guys that weren't and i hated the ones that were always like every game you know saying something and they're not following like you know what i mean like do your job yeah. first and then you can worry about your job so i was always make sure i'm taking care of my job and then guys Hopefully we'll see. I'm doing my job, and you'll just do your job. Now, if I got to go and call it a young guy, sure. But I try to do it usually on the side, you know, like a grab. That's not good enough, you know, or whatever. I didn't make a point in, in front of everybody. Up, That's yeah. just not my thing. And I thought always as a captain, you had to save your, you had to save your time when it, like get let's get the, our shit together. You know, you can't go to that every game. So it was like, this is a time now you got to wait. So after game six, loss in Edmonton, whoosh, shut the doors. You know, I'll, I'll never forget, Lavi started coming out of the coach's office. And I made eye contact. He just, we just looked at he each called other. called him off? Well, he just, he knew. He ran the other way. He just said, okay. He turned and went back in. Because I was standing, he, like, you know, he knew, man. That's what made him good. He didn't need to come in there. And it was, this is about us. Like, he knows it's, and so we, you know, had a little powwow. And said, shit, we're going for game seven. Who gives a shit, we're going home. Let's just do it there. I mean, you know, simple stuff, but it's, you know, that's what made him a good coach. And he was, he is a good coach. Yeah. Lavi gets it, you know. Speaking of coaching, when did you decide that that's what you wanted to get into? Like, I didn't. <laughs> no, man, I did this, this travel thing. I did this for 20, 21 years. I was like, I want to get in management. So my first year done, they put me as the development guy in Charlotte. Best job ever. I could drive two hours, go down and, play with the young kids and help them out on my schedule i'm coaching my son yeah this is great but i'm like mm. you know it's not quite a, i'm not doing really anything i'm trying to help the young guys out but they're in the minors two or three of them are gonna play maybe yeah. you know the guys up top are the guys that are the guys so like, like what else can i do and paul maurice goes can, can you be a come coach come help coach i, ah, I want to Coach my son and be with him. He goes, okay, well, just just come to the home games and the home practices. That's nice. It's the best gig ever. I should have just stayed with that one <laughs> because I'm like, this is awesome. I get to the games. I'm on the ice with the team when I can. And the best time I'm with my son, we're doing our thing, and I'm having the best time ever. But you're not really impacting anything. You know, like if you're not there with your foot on something, like what are you really doing? Like I was kind of helping, but not really. So then it got to then Jimmy Rutherford goes, you, I want you to coach. And when Kirk came in more full-time Kirk Muller came in and then I'm like yeah so I, I picked five or six weekends to go with my son and I missed the team you know so it was it was gradually starting to go and then they put me in full-time and then I said right, I'm going to do this I'm going to let's just go if I can try to do it so I have seven years I was assistant coach and went through Bill Peters went through you know that's that how long you assistant there yeah but but I learned see to me that was my education Bill Peters was a smart guy hockey guy like really smart guy. So I, I learned a lot from him. Now I learned a lot what not to do too. Yep. So there's the good and the bad. And I felt like, okay. And then I finally said to Ronnie, one time Ron Francis was a GM. I said, look, put, this is going nowhere now. I'm an assistant here. Like I got to put me in Charlotte. I'll be the head coach down there. I, I'm going to either do this or not do this. I can't keep this. This is not good enough. And he's like, well, we had, we think he had old Samuelson there at the time, his buddy, you know, and they're not going to get rid of him. So I was like, just kind of pissing in the wind a little bit and then just by fluke our new owner comes in and he doesn't know me from adam he, he doesn't have a clue of how you can do this i've been there seven years and we've been losing so how good can you be that's what he and that's what i would think too if i just walked into a new environment and don't know anything about hockey and we're losing for 10 years straight and you're part of that but yeah, assistant coach i mean how much are you really doing you know and and so he i don't know what made him all right, here, gave me the keys, but he was like, and it's work. here you go, and so far it's been great. So throughout those, um, I guess the later part of the, the seven years as the assistant, when you wanted to be a head coach, did you ever interview for any job? Yeah, oh. no, no, not head, no one would give me one. Really? So no one, I, I, and I won't say the team, cause, but 
they, they haven't done too well, but they're starting to do a little better. But anyway, uh, and two college jobs though. So I called. So I, I can, we can say this. It doesn't really matter. But I, I called Michigan State. So I'd been there, and a, well, a buddy of mine, the, the job opened up, and I'm like, all right. I thought it was a slam dunk. I so thought I played in the NHL forever. I've been an assistant coach here now for seven years. You know, Michigan State's been going downhill. Put my name in the hat. I'll see what, if they give it to me. I'll I'll take it, kind of thing. They won't call me back. And I'm like, <laughs> really? Fumble. And then, well, and the guys, well, I didn't finish my degree, so you don't have a degree. We're not. It's a non-starter. I go, yeah, but I'll I'll even take classes to finish it. Just you know, Granado's doing that in Man Wisconsin. Wilder. I mean, you know, yeah, whatever. But it, like, and they wouldn't do it. And then I called another place, and the the a- athletic director just said, we we don't we don't want to deal with it. You know, we ever have another guy. And I said, okay. So I said, all right, I guess I'm out of this. And then Tom took over and gave me the job. So it was probably a blessing that I didn't get to those jobs. But, you know, it's yeah. interesting. I literally thought, they're going to hire me. I mean, and that's crazy. Yeah. You mentioned now you, what you learned what and what not to do from Bill Peters. What are some other coaches you maybe pulled stuff Well, from? I was I mean, on staff with, with Paul Murray. That guy's the smartest guy going. Like, he, he knows what he's doing. Obviously, he's still coaching for how many years? Hundred years, right? So he knows he's doing. And then I said Kirk Muller and John McClain, they were that was that staff, and they're still going and their assistants now. But it's like so you're pulling for everything. And then as a player, you got coach. From, I just mentioned Laviolette. I mentioned all these guys that you take stuff from all of them. And then at the end of the day, you hope you know what you're doing. You just trust what you do, and you know you go at it. As as a coach, are you a guy who? Almost likes when a guy not not fights back, but speaks his opinion back to yeah. you. Yeah, like you want to. We be have honest, honest discussions. We have to because yep. I'm going to get into your face about stuff that I, I, that I feel is wrong to help you. You got to know that I'm just trying to help you. I mean, this is not, I got no stake in the game other than I'm trying to make you better to make us win. I mean, I'm not going to get on you just to get on you. Yep. So I'm hard on the top guys. I push them, and I think they appreciate that. I think I mean you know I think that's the way you have to be I mean that's just honest I'm just trying to I try to be honest with them I mean you can't there's a point where you probably can't be as honest as you want to be you know but I do try to say it how I see it that that first year you took over uh, unbelievable season you go to the Easter Conference Finals like did you see that as the year began or were you kind of just learning as you go and almost shocked at so the success? we we came in and I said we have I have a great video coach Chris Huffine this guy He's been around for all these guys. They matter more than people think, too. By 100%. This guy's as smart as a whip. And I said, Huff, this is what I envision. This is what I want to do. You know, and, and we kind of sat in, in the whole summer, and we just put clips together and stuff. And I'm like, okay, we want to play this way. It's, it's a little – it's actually a little radical on how we're going to do some things. But when we started I'm, – I'll never forget it. First game, preseason game down in Tampa. And I got a minor league lineup, and they're dressing their guys, which is good because those guys don't want to play, right? So it's okay. Everyone's like, oh, man, you're going to get pumped. I remember, no, you watch because – and we put a system in, and we went 5-1 in a preseason game. They don't care. But it mattered to us because I'm like, okay, I think we're on to something. And then, Bill, I don't think we lost a game in preseason. And if I had gone the other way, I'd, I'd have been like, oh, this, this, gonna this work. is terrible. We're going to get pumped. Now, we start that season, the first half season, we, we were 500, but we were dominating. So I, I'm like, I don't care about the scores. I'm watching the game. We're the better team that night. We're the better team that night. We're the better team that night. And I'm like, even though we didn't win because we couldn't score, we, we were t- – but I'm like, it's, this is the way to do this. And thankfully, our owner, who I was a little worried was going to be like, you're not winning. You know, he's like – because he's also an analytic guy and the analytics were off the charts that we were doing things right he's like just stick with it and then all of a sudden that in the second half of the year we didn't lose a game you know it was just like it all just came together so um i guess at the end of the day that, that beginning part was just a validation i, I think we're on to something and when you say radical what was it in terms well, of i just... can't tell you that but, oh shit no i gotta watch the honestly, tape you just look how teams play now i think they've they've adopted kind of way more aggressive style yeah with yeah, their you guys four like it's just fly it's, around they just they, it's there's little details on everything but i think it's just that mindset of listen let's just be aggressive let's go and you know i mean you're going to give up some chances here or there but yeah i'd rather lose a game that way than sitting back and you know um when brent burns came in you talked to him oh, in the summer yeah. what a great addition 
couldn't be better. I, I always say I wish we had him 10 years ago because, you know, he'd be a lifer. You know, like you don't yeah. get rid of a guy like that. Like, now we got him at the back end, but I'm, I'm happy to have him for one, two, three, four, five, how many years he wants to keep playing. Um, such a good dude. Like, he was in Dallas. I, mean, I talked about my son. We, his son plays with my son on the team. So we were down in Dallas yesterday watching our kids play. He's in the stands and I'm on the bench. But uh, it's he's a, just a – he is what he is, you know, a little quirky on things, but takes care of himself. He's 37 now. I think he can play a long, long time because yeah. he is dialed in on what I do and how hard I work. And, and what been the most refreshing thing about this guy, he's done everything except win, which I love that because he wants to win. But he's he wants to get better. He's 37. He's done everything. And he's like every day. How do I get better? Well, oh, man, I messed up here. What do I got to do different? Because, you know, he's a different system. He's doing yeah. it differently. He, he's like a kid trying to get better all the time, and that says a lot about the guy. Yeah. During the NHL events, like, there's certain topics seem to always come up, like the shootout, the playoff format. Would you like to see the playoff format go back to 1-8 to eight or even 1-16, through 16, or are you content what it is right now? Yeah, it's probably, what, are we, is it a little more? I, I don't know the right words to use on that. I mean, Sometimes you get some of the better teams get knocked out right away, yeah. maybe. But everybody's good now. Like, right. yeah, honestly, like one through sixteen, that matchup's not a slam dunk. Like back in the day when I was a kid, <laughs> like the first one. Th- I don't know why it was, but it was like a slam dunk when they did it like that. Um, I don't really. I think the playoffs are good. I don't think you expand the playoff. I don't think you can add more teams. Yeah. I think that's going to water it down a little. But like, the regular season should ma- matter, and it really almost doesn't. Like you got teams that are, you know. Strong. That's hard to be good for eighty-two games. And you, what do you what do you really get out of it? Yeah, and those two three matchups. You know, you're losing. A, yeah, a, a you get a game seven at home. Round. Yeah. Okay, thanks for eighty-two games, six months of doing it right. Like it's really not that much bonus. Yeah, I know? saw Crosby yesterday said he he wishes they went back to one through eight. It's not necessarily fair. It is tough to see good teams out that early. But the East is just it's yeah. unbelievable this year. It's so hard, and our division's hard. Like, I don't know, every game. Honestly, there's no easy games. And Do you, uh, do you talk about the trades? Like, are, are you guys going to try to make a move here? Well, we, yeah, I, I think so. Who, who I mean, we like? got, we've got a lot of cap space because yeah. we got injuries. It sucks because we had we had the move done. Pat it felt, it felt so bad. Pat Trady was the man. Think about this. We, we played with him all year without him, and now here he comes. And, and he know, had three he, goals already, didn't he? Yeah, three goals, and he hadn't even got going. He was still rusty as heck, and I'm like, this is it. We're, they don't put us over the edge, and then – you know, I hate it for him. I mean, he's such a good guy. He was working so hard, and it was the perfect fit. Exactly what we needed, you know. And uh, But you got to move on. I mean, that's that's life. Yeah, he was a guy in a seven-game series, you know he's getting three or four. It's right, just, that's at tough. the right times and in the right situations. You know, all the things that you – you know, you got a little leak on your boat. He's He was the, the plug, you know. So hopefully we find some. So you're here coaching the uh, Metro team for the All Star game. What are you going to tell the team before the game? I know it's you know they're all having fun out there. They're even... <laughs> I can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, listen, they, they're there to have fun. I, I we we I usually give a little like, what do we want to do here, boys? I mean, I'm, I don't, and I got no skin in this. Like, it's not going on my record, you know. Like, I mean, you want to play? You're, you're here for what an hour? You I, you can mail it in. That's fine by me. You're gonna work a little harder you might actually have fun that's what i think i mean if you if you really boil it down you put you same amount of time how many all-star games you playing i only played one turned down one but not even allowed to do that now i don't know but they back then it was like you know they call the team you're the guy do you want to do it no i'm going skiing with my kids because that's what i plan to do so no problem so yeah i didn't I, i mean but it was great it was in philadelphia so i was like 21 and the game was in Philadelphia. You want to see a great moment. This is a, hockey's about memories, right? Creating memories your whole career, or whatever. I'm 21, Gretzky, Lemieux, all these guys are in. I'm the only flyer in the event. So they get their ovations. It's loud as hell. I'm, guess who gets the loudest ovation coming out? This clown right here. And I'd only been there for three months. My first year there, they didn't matter. It didn't matter. That's what we talk about the flyer fans. I was wearing a flyer jersey. That kid, whoever it is, like they're making sure everybody knows yeah. he's our guy. You know what yeah. I mean? That was amazing. Longest ovation of the night. This guy, like, come on, 
right? And, I mean, that's that's pretty special. That's unreal. Uh, I, morning mat's not my special. I just want to make up for my early error. You had twelve hundred ninety-five total points in sixteen hundred forty-three games played. I just want to. So oh, you added the up. points. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I added you. the points up. Yeah, I screwed. Well, up. that's playoffs too. Right? Yeah, that's including, including yeah, yeah, playoffs. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. listen, I'm. Yeah, I, I was all right. Oh, I'll right? give you, you props, know? man. That's well, all, yeah. I mean, Actually, you, you know, you mentioned you play to win Stanley Cups, but you're a name that's always brought up as, as is he going to get into the Hall of Fame? Do you even think about it? I, I don't, except honestly. Like, I know you say me, people bring it up to you. Beat it up, because, they, no offense to any of the guys that got in there, if you just took my bio and you stuck it next to the guys that have gotten in, I, I, wait a minute, he's got more goals, he's got more assists, he's got a Stanley Cup. More games. He's done this, he's done that, like. Then you stick the picture there and go, oh, no, he's not we, not Hall of Fame. I'm like, okay, then just stop talking about it because every freaking year it gets brought up and I got to do interviews about it. It's like if I get in, then I, they stop talking about it or if I'm, or just say he's not going in. Like, you know what I mean? Because it's an constant. It's just like, you know, hey, it'd be great if it happens. I, I, and I said this uh, the last summer when it, I didn't get in. I'd like it to be sooner than later because the people that got helped me get in there – your parents, the people that matter, then they're, I don't know how much longer they got. My dad's, you know, health is, you know, those are the people you want to thank. Yeah. Other people like got you to do what you're doing. And if they're not around and like, they're yep. people you want yeah. to be able to thank, right? Yeah. So hopefully if it happens sooner than later, if it doesn't, you know, yeah, uh, you. it is what it is. Uh, just one last one. We got the stadium series coming up in a couple yeah. weeks. Is Raleigh all fight up for that? Big yeah. outdoor game? Oh, it's, I mean, I hope the weather's great, right? Because golly, it, it is such a cool, I think where they got it, like we have a great arena or football stadium. It's right across from the rink, and the sites are going to be good, apparently. It's one of the better ones, I guess they say, the way it's set up. And the crowd will be great. Like, the people are jacked about it. And it's just a novelty. I don't know if you guys have been to these I games. Like them. I yeah. like the outdoor games. I have never been to one, right? So it's, I love doing the thing, everything one time, right? Like, just check it off the list. So for me, it'll be cool just to sit back and kind of watch these guys. I think for the players, it'll be exciting their families like you just already tell like they're kind of yeah. this would just be cool and then move on from it but i think it, uh, i'm excited for the town they you know we we're supposed to have it and then COVID hit and it, uh, like like let's let's give these people something that they deserve they deserve a game like this well we can't thank you enough unbelievable oh. career great coach so good luck the rest of the way appreciate you guys having me on thanks for doing your homework you know i mean <laughs> I, I was actually surprised i thought this would just be you know a half ass gong show but you, you did your jobs man that's appreciate all, that's you. why i kept my mouth shut it would have been that's why i kept my mouth shut perfect Biz knew he couldn't ask me. thanks all again right. you got it thanks huge thanks to rod brindamore for sitting down with us the other day awesome dude we had an awesome chat with you hope everybody liked it out there so Moving right along, Biz, your boss, Gary Bettman, the 30 years as commissioner of the NHL, longest My anybody's boss. been running the league. Yeah, I mean, come on, man. At Kim the end Jung of the day, Bettman? isn't he? Your daddy, uh, Biz. He He's your daddy. He is? You think a little bit? Well, I guess you do call him King Jung Bettman, so I'll <laughs> say no. Keep going. Yeah, it's right? kind of been... A lot of people talking about his tenure, what he's done right, what he's done wrong. Has he been good, bad for the league? I mean, personally, I think he's been outstanding. Revenues have never outstanding? been higher. Outstanding? Uh, very good, I'd say overall. I'm I mean, with the, you, right. Anybody just who could set up a hockey league where I could get 500k guaranteed, he's a fucking <laughs> genius. So I will slob that knob till the end of time. Kim Jong Batman, baby, put fucking boards on the ads. Put fuck or uh, boards on the ads. Ads on the boards. Put fucking ads on my fucking forehead. Great job, Gary Batman. Happy 30th. Wait, why? Why aren't you a big fan? Uh, I didn't even say I wasn't a big fan. I I think that it. It's it's just a little ridiculous to stay outstanding. I mean, I I, I think overall he's done a good job, but uh, I also think we're looking at a commissioner who's been in charge for three different lockouts or strikes, I believe, um, which is more than Major League Baseball, NFL, and the NBA combined in that time. So when you're the maybe the fourth biggest sport in, in the United States, some say the fifth or sixth, and you have that much time missed to issues involved with CBA and what owners want, and Bettman's the guy in charge. It's hard for me to say it's been outstanding. When you talk about the revenues going up, which it certainly has, every single league's revenues have gone up. I mean, that's just what happens over the course of 30 years. That's not anything that you could look that's at and inflation. be like, oh my God, oh my God, look at the revenues are up from 30 years ago. No shit, dude. My boiler broke after 30 <laughs> years, too. I mean, like, you got to understand, over time, the revenues are going to go up. Um, 
I, I think he did a great job post-COVID in terms of getting the league back up. They, they were able to get the Stanley Cup final played. They were able the next year to have a different type of season that played out with the Canadian division. That was really good work. Um, I also look at the fact that we don't have a best on best internationally right now. It's hard to say he's not somewhat involved in that. Uh, so there's positives and negatives. Um, he was able to get the way, the league away from, uh, in quotations, the violence of the, of the early 90s and prior to that and, and make the game definitely safer, which is yeah, a good thing. It. At the same time, the game probably isn't as entertaining, some people will say. Um, you, you will not see a crowd get as fired up as they do for a fight when anything else happens. That's just what happens. Now, I, I think that the, the planned fights, even though there's a lot of guys not playing anymore because of that, is a good thing that those are gone. But uh, an aspect of emotional play and, and, and passion has kind of been taken away from the game in the regular season, I'll say. So the game's as fast and as skilled as it's ever been. And he's been at the helm for such a long time. There's some great things. But if you look at the entire big picture, I, I, I saying outstanding to me is crazy. No, no, that's, that's a very fair assessment and a lot of great points, Wit. So I guess you could go into the lockout situation. And I think that... Uh, Part of the narrative, and narrative is, and I think that you might agree with it, where he, he kind of like the, the top eight teams control most of the league, and he kind of meets with those guys, and they decide on what goes on, and he basically protects those guys. I think that the hard cap has been something that he's really stuck by, where uh, outspoken agents like Alan Walsh might be able to put up a, a better point as to you know why that hurts the league in the long run, uh, why the players get stiffed out of it. I think he recently posted something about like salaries compared to the other three major sports. Now, mind you, I would probably compare them most to, to what is it, baseball and basketball. I don't think it's fair to put up against football because that is just an absolute juggernaut. Whereas like Yes, NBA players do make, I think the top players make 44 to closer to 50 million, whereas in the NHL, the top earn, earning player is making 12. Yes, there is also double the amount of revenue and half the amount of players. So from that perspective, it's pretty close as well as with baseball. But baseball does have a little bit of a different dynamic, which you could just say the I think the the TV right deals that they have that put a lot of money in their pocket. Uh, the what's the other thing where the the top end teams kind of pay down to the lower end teams? Revenue sharing. There's there's revenue sharing. Did I already say double the amount of games as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's other things. I know obviously bigger rosters as well. But I think from from what the players are being guaranteed to get paid, and from the way that it has grown in comparison to those other sports, where maybe in a sense playing you know fourth fiddle in in the states especially from from a, from a game perspective so I think he's kept up with pace um agree completely with the best on best I think that that he definitely has fumbled the ball I've been adamant for the past like probably three four years on here about saying fuck off don't don't give it the Olympics I don't really care about the Olympics I know maybe the players might but the fact that that's one of the highest grossing if not one of the most grossing sports at the Winter Olympics where you could set up that infrastructure yourself and also control where it is where at least to start probably keep it in North America Whereas like sometimes it, it, it's being played in China. It's like how many people are staying up for those games? So especially from an American perspective is you're just losing that natural viewership. Um, I think that the, the blockbuster trades or lack thereof um, are a, a result to that hard cap situation, which I think from a newsworthy perspective and garnering, you know, getting more better players playing against better players and loading up come playoff time, I think that hurts us. I'd, I'd rather see it as a soft cap. But other than that, man, just to control everything and, and for it to go the way that it's gone, I mean, it's it's really hard to nitpick overall. Some people are talking now about the, the TV viewership, but I think through all viewing platforms via streaming and through cable, um, viewership is up. R.A., I'll throw this one over to you. This is something that Hold on. But before you go over to R.A. and he can go over the, the numbers in terms of viewership being down 22% and all that. Correct. The other thing that, that is an issue is the rules of hockey and how clueless people are. And I'm not saying people are clueless. How, how confused we all are in terms of like, dude, we're talking about... Goal or no goal, right? This is still an enormous issue. We got the offside reviews people can't stand. I don't stand. like the offside we reviews either, but I don't think you're ever going to 
through through means of contact when it comes down to decision making i don't think that that's ever going to change that's just human error and going over and over it and and having human opinion in that room who are making the decision i get that sometimes they're going to get it wrong but what are you going to do incorporate robots to make the call <laughs> i don't well fuck they're taking over everything you might as well we got the fucking balloon up in the air. I don't know what the hell's going on with that. You guys heard about the Chinese balloon that's spying on us? Yeah, we gunned that. We gunned that fucker down about <laughs> twenty days too late. <laughs> they got. We waited till it got, got all this. the way. We we let it get all the way across the country, and then we got it. You know what I mean? So it was good timing. Yeah. What the fuck's <laughs> going on, Navy? Wake up! Would would the all the skills competition put you to sleep? Wake up! <laughs> So I don't think that that's ever going to leave. I think that uh, I think the offside review has just slowed it down to a whole never another level. I don't want as many TV timeouts. I want shorter bursts. What's the main complaint about baseball right now? Attention it's span slow. and how slow it is. Put the fucking shot clock on these pitchers. I mean, all they're doing okay, is so, putting sticky so- tack on the ball for, for, during that time. Anyway, they're getting bored. <laughs> so so. We, th- this will lead into the, the viewership thing, but like this new deal was done with ESPN and, and, and a lot of people said, oh my God, we're back on ESPN. This is great. I remember Merle said right at the time, he goes, this is fucking brutal. He goes, it's going to be on ESPN Plus. It's a streaming thing. And now, already, you can go into what we were talking about after the Brindamore uh, interview in terms of why viewership is down 22% from last year. Like that, that, that's crazy to me. And it's because of the streaming. The games are never on fucking ESPN, dude. Yeah, you got to go was, online. How many hockey fans don't even know how to do that? I, I think in the United States, it's I, I live in Arizona, and there's not a lot of games that are blacked out. So when I go on that app, like I, I have access to seven, eight different games at a time sometimes, and most of which that are on the schedule that night. All right, I think what you're going to be talking about is the blackout situation, how many different streaming services and maybe even cable that you have to pay for in order to access to watch your team play. So I'll hand it over to you. You seem to know more about it. Yeah, Bettman cited the games being on ESPN Plus as a reason that the numbers are down. He said they're not worried about it. Quote, our ratings are fine. Let's not get too carried away with ratings because viewership overall is up nationally. Now, if viewership's up, how are ratings down? I think it's because everything is so split up and spread out now, Biz. You got, you know, one game streaming on this network. You got one game that can be seen on this home market, but not, you know, one state over. It is it is a total clusterfuck. And like I was saying you two the other day, like so many older fans are getting screwed. Like, you know, guys like my old man, if I didn't get him the internet, he wouldn't be able to see any of these games. But there are a lot of fans that aren't going to get the internet. They're not, they got flip phones. They're not going to sign up for new technology. And those are the people that are really getting screwed that would like to watch games. So when you limit it to just the internet, a lot of people aren't going to be able to see that shit. So basically saying more people are watching, but the numbers for those particular outlets are going down. They need to fix the streaming issue too, man. Like the blackout rules, people in Montana, Idaho, they're hundreds of miles from teams and they're getting blacked out from two, three different teams. That's where they're shooting themselves in the foot. I don't know how they fix that because everybody has all these contracts that fucking go head to head with this one. It does get very boring and confusing, but confusing. But for his tenure biz, to go back to your question there, I think he's been good with the relocation stuff minus Arizona. That's a black eye for them committing to that the way they have the concussion stuff denying that shit that's the bad stuff but i don't know man the labor stuff he he does the bidding for the for the owners they had for three labor stoppages but that's not carrie bettman's fault you know the owners have way more leverage in that league than they do in other leagues it seems like and they push the players around so i don't really blame the labor shit on bettman the lottery system i think has worked they've opened the game up the COVID stuff i thought he navigated very well i yeah. mean he was able to pull off two stanley cups during you know the whole fucking worldwide pandemic uh, the Olympic stuff, I know we haven't had him lately, but that came under his time. Uh, I, yeah, I think he's done a good job. I think his positives very much out, outweigh his negatives in his tenure here. I would, I would hopefully give him they a can grade fix the TV of an, an A-. An A-. Yeah, okay, what would you think the biggest stain is, not a best on best? Are you, and are denying you- the concussions. Denying the 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 relation to CTE and stuff like that, which is probably all related to like lawsuits and things like that. If you admit to it, who knows what you end up dealing with in terms of players suing and things like that. But I mean, are we really going to sit here and say that concussions have no effect? Like, there's no effect of CTE from concussions. I mean, is that not completely false? I mean, I yeah, that, fine. that's that's why so, I said that's yeah, yeah, not. Yeah, you're you're doing good. Um, all right, the the question I had is. 
for the report to come out and say viewership's down 22 percent how like how is it possible that he's saying the viewership's up i'm i don't understand like the 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 crisscross there. Well, because the the ratings are typically they're done maybe with uh, monitors on TVs. They I think they can guess at streaming. So basically, they're taking numbers from one maybe particular area, whether it's TNT or ESPN. Say, oh, these numbers are down, but all the people that are streaming, you know, on ESPN Plus, those numbers are up. So there so might that's be more not people included. watching. It, it depends, honestly. When they cite ratings, there's usually an asterisk on there to tell you like who's citing it because. There's, you know, Nielsen, which has been around forever, Arbitron, and plus stream, streaming. That's the new one. So you got to really see who's providing the numbers and, you know, what exactly the numbers are for because it, it does get confusing as to, you know, who they're representing. But it does seem like more people are watching, but there's more headaches trying to find the games. They do need to fix that because every game, people are tagging me, and it's, it is bullshit. They're paying whatever they're paying, cable bills, cable fees, sign up for one channel, and they can't even watch uh, their favorite team. So... But like I said, on the whole, man, I, I don't have any major real issues on it. So uh, 30 anniversary, man, that's a, that's a long time. That's a I, long I think, time. I think, how much longer do you think he stands? I think he's been commissioner longer than anyone else ever has been, right? Oh, yeah, as I think far he's as actually NHL? The, yeah. Yes. Yeah, he's the first actual commissioner. They used to have a, I don't know what the difference was between president and commissioner, but he's the actual oh, okay. first one to have that title. And uh, what was another topic? I feel like this one comes up all the time. They asked Crosby about doing the playoff stuff. This is another one, Bet another one Bettman talked about. Sid said, yeah, they prefer one through eight like I think a lot of people do. But Bettman was saying it's not as easy to just say, oh, we're going to do it now. Because then they have to recalibrate all the schedule for everybody. they got to balance it all out. Basically, it doesn't sound like they're going to go back to one to eight anytime soon. So we're going to continue to see, you know, top teams in the league get knocked out, you know, second round, third round, whatever. So... Uh, let's see it just else. makes it, it it makes it in a sense of like this this regular season is so important and so long and such a grind and then you don't necessarily get rewarded right so it's it, it is a tad unfair now they're talking about the adding two games to like create even more rivalries which I I mean two extra games like is that really gonna like create these new or different or expand these rivalries I don't know but. It's not it's it's not fair to see Toronto and Tampa play each other this year. It's just not. And I understand that that's how it works and it's kind of like, oh, woe is me, play better, get that number 1 seed, but those fan bases don't deserve to get knocked out first round. And that's me saying about the Maple Leafs. Yeah, he said it involves a whole host of other issues that have to be addressed and well, he didn't get specific about it. So Logistics. I don't know if it, that was just his lawyer answer, logistics answer, but yeah, it doesn't seem like it's a, around the bend anytime soon. Uh, regarding the sale of the Senators, they've got about 15 or more parties involved with the application process. Uh, they basically have to pay the NHL a fee to look at all the numbers behind the scenes, decide if they want to make a formal bid. Uh, he said, though, whoever buys them, they're going to keep them in Ottawa, and there's still possibility for a new arena there, which kind of ties back to what we were just saying about Florida, man. When your arena is that far away, it, it's such a deterrent, I think, for, for a lot of people to not want to travel, you know, 40 minutes. It, 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 is, it is seriously like this is no... All right, so so Arizona ended up getting the land for free, I believe, in Glendale, or, or a yes. crazy bargain instead of Scottsdale. And I don't know this for a fact, but I think it's pretty obvious that there was definitely a, a deal, uh, a better deal financially to have the arena in Sunrise as opposed to Miami or Fort Lauderdale. But it's like, and, and it goes hand in hand with my fucking stupid, terrible house I have. You, you When you have to do something, um, you're better off spending the money at the time to yeah. make sure it's going to be good in the long haul. Correct. Yeah. So it's like, don't try to patch it together. Like I have, cause I'm an idiot. Just do it right. When you do the job. And if you end up not doing that, you get crushed. You end up paying more along the lines of over the years, things going wrong while well, they cheaped out on Arizona and they cheaped out on Florida. And now you got these two fucking horrible, well, I guess not anymore in Arizona, but Florida, you're stuck with this building in the middle of nowhere with nothing else around it besides a guardian angel that works at the yard house. And, and you're stuck with this horrible, I mean, I'm not going to say horrible fan base. There's some great, honest, uh, loyal Florida Panthers fans, but Nobody wants to go to games out there. It only it's works, a pain in the it ass only to, works get to for football, where there's eight games a year. Eight and games a, a year. a huge, huge parking lot, and they can tailgate all day long. That's the only time it's going to work if you want to put a field or, or any type of venue uh, 30 to 45 minutes out of town. I mean, what the Patriots do it too, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, football down, works. Down football, and football also owns about two days of the week, yeah. so it's, it's just a totally different story. 
Uh, a couple of signings while we were gone as well. The Capitals made two of them. Uh, they locked up Dylan Strom with a five-year, $25 million extension. That'll keep him in D.C. through 28. Uh, he's got 37 points in 52 games this year. 25-year-old forward would have been RFA this summer. And Sonny Milano is also extended. Three-year, $5.7 million deal. Comes out to 1.9 AAV. Uh, he would have been unrestricted this summer, but he got himself a nice little raise from 750k this year and a little bit of stability. He's got 22 points in 40 games as well. Well, I mean, he went. He went. Um, Where did he go on a tryout? He went to Calgary. Calgary. And so I mean, to go to go on a PTO, man, you don't know what you could end up in Russia like I did or the AHL like Biz. Um, he ends up getting a three-year deal. He's playing well there, so. Good for both those and, guys. And some security for Sonny Milano, as, as well as Dylan Stroman. I'll get to him in a second. But, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a bargain and not a high risk for a guy who could really pop off offensively. I think there's some major upside, just like there was Dylan Strom. I mean, he was third overall draft pick by the Coyotes. Um, I don't think he ever really got an opportunity here. I think he was still growing into his body. He ends up going over to Chicago. Um, a lot more offensive-minded there, but maybe his defensive game lacked a little bit. And then I think that with Backstrom being out and him getting those reps and having just – he must have had a great offseason. He came in fucking hot out of the gate. He's been wonderful with the Capitals. And to fucking get a five-year deal, 25 sheets, talk about security, man. I'm so happy for the guy. And uh, fuck, man, that's another team lookout now that they're healthy. And I would imagine that he's, what, going to be their third-line center? And he can provide some offensive upside. Maybe he's their second-line center with that, with that group. But nonetheless, man, fucking congratulations to both those guys. All right, moving along here. Biz, I want to ask, is there a team currently in a playoff spot uh, that won't be at season's end? Oh, I'd have to relook at the, the the Western Conference, but that buddy, there's a team that's probably leading their division right now that there's a chance they're not in it because it's so tight. Um, currently, currently in the East, if I had to pick a team, and and we, you talked about the the lack of their health, I'm a little bit concerned about the Penguins, although confident that they will make it. So that would probably have to be my pick in the East. Uh, you think the P Penguins are more likely to miss than the Caps? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm more confident, and in, in, you know, yeah, I'm more now that they're fully healthy for sure. Um, and then in the West, I got my West pick. I'll let you go on West and see if I agree with you. Vegas, you think they're gonna miss now? Okay, well, I if guess if I had to pick a team, I guess man, we should get to the news too. Um, Stone second back, poor Mark Stone. Ugh. That fucking sucks, dude. I Back surgery is something I'm, I'm very lucky I've never had to deal with, but talking to people who have, it is horrible. I mean, anyone who's ever had a back issue, it's like you can't even breathe without feeling pain. And this is his second one, I believe, on the same issue. I hope I'm getting that correct. But his second month, maybe it's not the same issue, but what, within nine months, he's now had two back surgeries? Fuck, dude. So he's not going to be back till the playoffs. Eichel's struggling right now. Thompson's cooled off. And this team... They can't win. So uh, from leading their division and looking great, uh, I think it was a six or seven point lead um, over L.A. who was second in the Pacific. All of a sudden, they're now just dropping like a friggin' anchor. And the two wildcard teams, Edmonton and Colorado, they're not going anywhere. They'll both be in the top three of their division by the end of the season. So you look at how Vegas is going, unless they can switch things around. But Mark Stone is such a big loss. It's like, how do you replace a guy that's so good at both ends of the ice? I'd have to piggyback that. I don't think there's a better pick, especially with the Mark Stone news. And yeah, it's. Uh, and dude, Eichel if they miss the playoffs, holy shit. Last year, you missed the playoffs. Shit happens. Te good teams miss the playoffs, you know, once in a while. It's not that shocking. But when you do it two years in a row and you make all these big moves, it's like that's when you start panicking. Like, what, what is the actual issue here? I don't know if guys all of a sudden are tuning out Cassidy, which seems to happen relatively quickly. I just. That team is such a, a bizarre, like the whole organization is so bizarre. The way things have gone down, we've talked about it over and over for three years now, and you see like this team come out gangbusters to start the season, and then to go on the run they've been on these last eight games, like there's something there that's, that's, that's an enormous issue. I, I can't put my finger on it exactly, but not having your captain and your best player, well, I mean, one of your two best players in the lineup, it's like, I don't know how they recover from that. Yeah, he got a uh, successful back surgery Tuesday, January 31st. The team said he will be 
out of the lineup indefinitely expected to make a full recovery, but obviously doesn't help him this year. Also, too, I think their fans, excuse me, might have got spoiled early with that. You know, first year, they think every year is going to be that way, but that, that's not how it works in the NHL, and they didn't make the playoffs last year in danger possibly of not making them this year. So, I don't know. You think, you think that probably happened a little bit, Biz? They think it's going to be every year that you get that, that first time out of the gate? Oh, yeah. I think it's created the, some psycho fans in that, in that area for sure. Uh, going back to Stone, too, and like, Listen, I'm not a fucking doctor, but I, you know, his stride is his <laughs> his stride tends to be a little bit on the choppier side, and that's how I tended to skate. I didn't have a very fluid stride, and I think that just over time, there that just becomes a lot of wear and tear. With also trying to keep up out there with all these fast new players, so talk about a guy who's got a lot of hard miles on him as far as like his stride and just how hard he plays and. You know, the fact that he at the very defensive forward where he's playing up and down the ice constantly, he's a shot blocker, he does it all. Man, I I talk about it all the time more than I talk about those DHM detox and give them away at weddings. Like, how many times have I pulled my L5S1 as a result of that short, choppy stride? I don't know what part of the, his back he's getting surgery on. There was an opportunity me, me to get surgery on that L5S1. I declined. Because when I'm told, once you have the first one, it's just a domino effect where they keep going, keep going. It's always you telling the airline stories. When I was uh, sitting next to a guy when we were on, on the way down to our Pink Whitney commercial, and I just got chat with him. He was going to a golf tournament, and I said, oh, like, you know, enjoy it, have fun. He goes, oh, I better. He goes, I'm out for the next nine months with back surgery after like this round. And I'm like, oh, no, that sucks. And he's like, yeah, this is going to be like my 12th one. And I was oh, like, my 12th? God. And for a guy who retired early and all he wants to do is golf, I just felt the pain like rolling oh. off his tongue when he told me Well, they me that. say it's like any part of your body, it's like go to every single length to not get surgery, any type of rehab possible without before oh. you get surgery, your back being number one. I mean, it's just number never going to be – you get a, you get surgery on your body for the most part. I mean, there's obviously minor issues that can end up being better. I mean, Tommy John surgery is incredible. It's changed people's lives, pitchers in terms of like you almost come back stronger, but most surgeries, it's never quite right again. Your back being number one in terms of you might feel better again, but you're never going to be what you were before. And to see a high-level athlete going through it like Stone is, it just makes me feel so bad for him. I played with another guy, Martin Hansel. He was going through the back issues all another the time. Another big too. guy who wasn't the best skater, right? Yeah, just it's just hard on the body, man. Wait, is there a, a current team out of the playoffs right now you think that will get in by the uh, season's end? Yeah, I said the Islanders. Um, maybe a little bit of a reach for me. Um, but then in the West, I will go with – I'll go with Calgary. Uh, they're actually probably the only team who has a chance. Nashville is just – like the definition of mediocrity, I, I I don't see them getting in, even though Saros is probably, fuck man, Allmark's just lighting it up, but Saros might be the guy for the Vesna right now, him, Sorokin, and Allmark, so maybe that gives them a somewhat like fighter's chance, but I think Calgary comes out hot and, and ends up getting in. What about you, Biz Nasty? Who I'm not going right to say now Calgary. In? Well, yeah, you're <laughs> good on them. <laughs> Uh, you're, if you're asking who I think has the best chance, I actually think the Islanders on the outside looking in have the best chance. I just don't think they will make playoffs. And that's more of a hope than actual facts because like front to bottom, their fucking lineup looks good. And now all of a sudden, if they get hot offensively, l look out because they got the goaltending. That, that Pellic is back in the lineup now. So like if they catch some steam, and I, as you said, R.A., if they make playoffs, that's chipping a chair for the Islanders. I could see them going to the Eastern Conference Finals like that. Because that's just a playoff style team. So I know I'm contradicting myself and saying I don't think they will. But out of every team outside looking in, I think they're the biggest threat. You can't like pick them after Butch Goring dropped his nuts on your face <laughs> on Twitter. So I understand. But I, I've I, said I've said a few times on the pod they're not making playoffs. Okay. He asked me, "Is there one that's outside looking in who I could see making playoffs?" Yes, the New York Islanders. I mean, Calgary Flames, they just haven't had their mojo all year. Uh, Huberdeau was banged up early. I don't know if that injury is still lingering. The big, there's a, been a big enough sample size of Huberdeau there to see things aren't necessarily clicking, at least so far this year. So based on what I saw in, in his, his offensive capabilities in Florida, 
my guess would be that he's injured of some sort and trying to play through it because there's no other explanation for me as to why he's not putting up the numbers like he was. Um, could it be not adapting to Sutter's system? Um, my understanding is that there's a divide maybe in the locker room as to the, the players that had success under Sutter's system, especially last year, who truly believe in him. And maybe some some guys who have kind of given up or maybe not given him a chance based on the antics that they're seeing. Like, I don't know if we talked about it already, the 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 rookie who they asked about in the lineup. And yeah, just we the talked way about he, that a few weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, just like little examples, like the Huberto, where was he? And my understanding at that time, Huberto had gone down the tunnel to get treatment on the table for this injury he had early on. And a new guy coming to your team and a guy who's accomplished what he's accomplished – maybe show a little bit of respect. And I think that he viewed that as disrespectful, but I don't think that he's also coming off of his ways and his guard because Sutter is going to beat the Sutter's drum. He did it in LA. He he's done it wherever he's gone. He had success in LA doing it though. Right. To the point where even when the players were like mutinying against him, they were like, let's win to fuck over this guy. But it's just like, well, he still gets the credit for it. So I just, I'm not seeing this team buying in at any point. I'm not seeing any change. Um, a, a big component to that, and I know that uh, the backup goalie is at Vladar, yeah. who used to be with the Bees. He's kind of taken over as the number one as far as now. There's no way they get anywhere if Markstrom doesn't get back yep. to where he was last year, and that's just plain and simple. Something's not clicking right now, and I just don't believe enough in it for them to, to, to figure out their ways in this short period of time. You just got to think tree living – as crazy as it sounds, is just really hoping uh, Huberto is injured because the ten the ten million doesn't even start till next year, uh, and that's eight years of, of ten or ten and a half, whatever it was. So um, it's pretty scary to, to bring a guy over and sign him to that and and see the production be at these unbelievably record setting numbers in terms of a winger the year prior and the few years prior, and all of a sudden to have this. So. I would lean towards towards your opinion, Biz, that he's probably battling something. You don't just drop off that quick like this. Well, one team that will not be going to the playoffs this year, the Montreal Canadiens, they do have a nice little future set up for them, but we were lucky to get Captain Nick Suzuki the other day, have a nice little chat with him in Fort Lauderdale, so we're going to send it over to him right now. This interview is brought to you by Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut is bringing big back with the big New Yorker. It's bigger and cheesier with six Extra large foldable slices, it's huge. We were down Fort Lauderdale last week looking for a snack. Me and G hit up Pizza Hut three or four times. The stuff is unreal. And you can go big, so you can go bigger with the biggest, boldest pizza in the game right now. The Big New Yorker is back and better than ever after nearly 25 years. Probably the only guy on the show old enough to have it way back in the day. I'm so glad it's back. Good stuff. Nice cheesy thickness. The dough is unreal. The sauce is great. And only for a limited time. So you got to go big before it goes away. Also, Pizza Hut will be sponsoring the Battle of the Badge between NYPD and FDNY on the ice on Long Island, April 15th. Gee, you fight up for that. How many slices are you going to whack back that day? All right, I've said it once, and I've said it again, and I'll say it again. Uh, pizza is my favorite food. So the fact that Pizza Hut is not only coming to Chicklets, but they're coming in on the Battle of the Badge, which is a great cause, just makes my heart warm. I, like you said, it's bigger, it's cheesier. Everyone knows me. Everyone knows I love a little cheese. So go to PizzaHut.com, order the Big New Yorker today. It doesn't get any better than that. Well said, buddy. Well said. Once again, PizzaHut.com, order the Big New Yorker today. All right, it's time to bring on our next guest, the 13th overall pick of the 2017 draft. This center is currently in his fourth NHL season, and he'll be playing in his second All-Star game this weekend here in sunny Florida. And prior to this season, he was named the 31st captain in Montreal Canadiens history, as Biz said, the youngest ever. It's a pleasure to welcome to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Nick Suzuki. Congrats on the All-Star gig, brother. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. I think ah, the first pleasure. time we all met was last year at the All-Star game in Vegas. Yeah, where were we? Uh, I don't know. Great dinner spot. I'm, I'm forgetting the name off the top that, of my head. That, that, that trip. Catch, catch, catch. yes. That yeah, trip's catch, kind catch, of like, yeah. I've tried to erase that one from memory. <laughs> but second All-Star for you, that's unreal. I can't believe it's your fourth year in the league. It's like, what the? where the hell does the time go, right? Yeah, that's pretty much how I feel. Um, kind of a veteran on my team right now. But uh, yeah, it's fourth year. It's pretty crazy. I feel like the season, right, It's it's been a little bit of a struggle, but I think people kind of figured that going in. But close group of guys, is it a fun locker room to be a part of? 
Yeah, super fun. Uh, we have a great group, really close, like yeah. you said. Um, a lot of younger guys bringing a, a ton of energy and new life, so uh, it's always fun to go to the rink. Are you trying to force the other guys on the team to learn French? Because I've, I've read that as the captain, <laughs> you were trying to, uh, to to get the vocals. And, and Do you the, speak French? He's trying to learn. A little bit, yeah. Wow. C'est quoi ton, ta favorite couleur? Uh, rouge. Blue, R blonde, and rouge. Okay, that's a good <laughs> a good answer for the month. You just asked him favorite color? Favorite color. That's big. And that's I said, deep right I, there. Is it, how do you say chicklets. favorite in French? I, even I'm... Uh, favorite favori. Fe fe favori couleur. <laughs> yeah. So even I'm a little bit rusty on my French. We have you, to take it in Ontario, so uh, it's cool. How, how like, who are you? Who are you learning from? How are you learning? Uh, a few guys on the team, obviously, and then Babel, big. Uh, You're a Babel guy, huh? Big help. Just trying to learn, like. Yeah. Little sentences around the city helps out. So ideally, at some point, maybe do a, a press conference with all the French media and stuff, just doing it that way. I mean, if I could do that, that'd be pretty impressive. <laughs> that mean but, that means you uh, crushed it. Yeah. <laughs> I mentioned the captaincy in the intro. Uh, were you surprised when the team approached you with it at first? Or were we kind of expecting it? What was your reaction on that? Um, yeah, I think it was between a couple of us. And um, Marty came up to me before the uh, draft last year and said, I think we want to name you, but I want uh, you to take the time and think about it and just go over it in your head and come back to me later. So, uh, yeah, I took the time through the summer and, uh, it was pretty much a no brainer for me, uh, near the end of the summer. Did you have to like consult with anyone like talking about the captaincy, given the fact that you were given time to think about it? Yeah. I talked to, uh, Shea Weber, uh, it was a big uh, influence on me in my first few years there in Montreal. And I mean, he's a, uh, was a great captain for me and all the other guys and just, a lean on him and give get get advice from him is uh, being a bit big a bit oh, been a big help for me so being such a young captain are there guys on your team that you're leaning on this year like josh anderson guys like that to kind of help you transition to being the leader yeah we got a lot of great older guys um david savard big one um joel edmondson brendan gallagher's around even though he's hurt but just guys that i get to talk to and, and learn off of still and uh, they support me 100%, and uh, that's what you want when you're a younger captain. Yeah, I think one player that's been a, a huge name in Montreal this year, Abba Jacki, a.k.a. Wi-Fi. What, tell me what he's meant to the lineup as far as, you know, like not to say protecting a guy like you, but kind of protecting no, a guy like you. No, he's his bodyguard. Yeah. That's exactly why <laughs> yeah. he's there. Don't right. touch Suzuki. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's been he's been awesome. Just a big surprise for uh, pretty much the whole NHL, and uh, he's earned his right to be there and he's and his, with his play, and just a guy that you know what he's he's gonna bring to the lineup and uh, Chris Wadman always says I'm not gonna do anything but my partner will beat you up. So <laughs> credit, credit where it's due. Who gave him that nickname? Uh, yeah, Chris Wadman actually okay. gave him Wi-Fi. Um, I don't know if he likes it that much, but uh, I mean it's blown up a lot. <laughs> oh, so. it's, it's, a not lot going, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. A lot uh, worse than that. He's like better offensively with the puck than I thought too. Yeah, he's got sneaky skill, yeah. which is pretty impressive and. Uh, actually, he was a smaller guy growing up, so I think he played a skilled game, and oh, really? all of a sudden he got huge. So um, yeah, he got he still got his little man skill and a big body. I, I played uh, golf with Mark Stoll yesterday, and somehow Wi-Fi came up. And uh, I think we were talking about how the league's different, like la some lack of toughness. And he's like, oh, that, that Wi-Fi guy had me in the corner. He's holding me, or I was holding him. And he said, you have three seconds to let go. And so I was like, okay, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Is he a psycho like that off the ice too? Oh, he's a great guy. Um, he loves to have fun, but when, it's, when he's on the ice, he turns into a different guy. But yeah, he's a beauty off the ice. You know, you, you came to Montreal. You were traded before you'd ever played in the NHL. So what was that like? I mean, it's got to be surprising and kind of shocking to be a first-round pick and all of a sudden you're moved. Like, how did you find out? How did it all go down? Yeah, it was a big shock for me. Uh, just finished a rookie camp game and uh, GM called me into his office and I, I thought I was either playing really bad or I was getting <laughs> traded. So, uh, yeah, I thought when I got drafted, all of us thought we were just going to build the Vegas team together and now most of us are gone out of that draft so uh, just a change like that but i was really excited to get to montreal and have an opportunity to try to make the team pretty early and uh, i don't know if i would have had that in vegas I mean, it's a dial back early in the career i was reading oh, i saw an interview with your dad you, you used to cry when he beat you at checkers back in the day so you like had this competitiveness since you were a little kid i guess huh yeah i think uh he always tried to try to beat me so uh yeah i built that competitive drive up and uh i, I hate losing and anything so was just, that how you got in the game your dad yeah my dad was a 
big hockey fan growing up played a little bit but uh, nothing too high but uh, he got me and my brother on skates pretty early and just we love the game both of us and now we're both pretty good hockey players so yeah, it's it turned insane. out well. have two I, I brothers was, make it I, I was reading uh, that you like went to a high school that was specific to the arts like what like what what brought you into that were you like a big painter like artist like what like how did you get into that <laughs> yeah it was elementary school it was not my choice but it was uh, finger painting yeah yeah i actually did painting were you were you a good painter average painter pretty good knitter uh, <laughs> actually yeah i'm uh, not i'm just not even kidding i was pretty good at knitting and doing that stuff but it just kind of was a different school it was a private school in london uh, just more focused on the arts and kind of like less technology. But. Okay, like what other things besides knitting and, and finger painting were you doing? Uh, let's see. Crochet. I don't What's know if crochet? You know I think it's the same as knitting, it's isn't close. it? close. Yeah. Yeah. Different uh, needle. Yeah. I remember like just we always had drawing and painting. I, everything was based off like an art form. So it was no like we didn't have TVs or like smart boards or anything, but I would hear about it from my friends and – uh, I left in grade seven to go to the hockey school, so that was a big change for Is me. Is that what you get for the guys on the team? Do you like knit them stuff for, for like Christmas <laughs> yeah, I should gifts do that. or birthday gifts? I remember making socks one year in school, so maybe I can. Yeah, McDavid's still wearing them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'll make some for Cole. I want to keep going on the, this crazy school that you went to. Like, 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 what brought you there? Your parents sent you there? Like, that's Yeah, my parents, uh, my dad's. Uh, co-workers kids went there so they checked it out thought it would be good for for me and my brother and i was there till grade seven so uh, it's kind of a big part of my childhood for sure not a lot of athletes were going to that school but uh, i was kind of me and my brother were the only hockey players pretty much there were you one of those kids obsessed with the game from the time you can remember like oh, shooting pucks all that always trying to get better like watching nhl games at a young age yeah, uh, ever since I can remember, I was watching games and playing mini sticks, river yeah. hockey, through my brother in net, of course. <laughs> uh, older brother always got to shoot, but yeah, I was just pretty obsessed with hockey since a really, really young age. And soccer as well. You played uh, pretty high competitive soccer to what, the age of about 14? Yeah, I played soccer every single summer uh, until, yeah, 14, just try to focus on hockey, but um i knew with soccer i hated going to practice but i just like playing the games so i knew that and i was kind of getting out of it do you think that trans transition well into like your vision on the ice because that's probably one of the things you're most known known for is like maybe slowing the play down and just the way that you're able to like you know see and scan everything yeah yeah soccer is great for that um finding holes area passes uh conditioning was probably a big one i was played center mid so i was running around everywhere and had to be all over the place so um yeah it's a great sport i know you said your dad never pressured you do you think that's probably a reason why you got as far as you have because you didn't have one of these crazy hockey dads all over your, over your shoulder all the time yeah my dad kind of transitioned out of it he always when we were younger he was kind of a crazy hockey parent but he felt like he was being an idiot and so he kind of no dialed shit, it really? back yeah i want yeah. the refs like my old man <laughs> i don't know but like but he remembers being like kind of crazy about it and then all of a sudden he's like i can't be doing this anymore and wow. kind of dialed it back on us and uh yeah i think i just kept me and my brother hungry and uh we never got ripped in the car like a lot of other stories so uh yeah he just always said good game and uh, left it at that looking back I, my, my dad was just like he just wanted effort. And then the days I was dogging it and I knew I was dogging it, I'm like, oh my God, this is an hour ride home. This <laughs> my is dad good. was just getting banged up with all the other parents and no matter how I play, I'd be dashed for He'd say, hey, great game. I'm like, did you even fucking watch the game? Between, between <laughs> He's in the bathroom with Yolanda. You're like, dad, uh, you weren't even watching. <laughs> Go ahead, all right. I don't even know why. Yeah, I, said I don't that. know how to follow, follow that one. Uh, now, going into the draft, obviously, you had a dynamite junior career. Like, do you have any expectations heading into it where you went or you would just say, hey, fuck, I let the chips fall where they may? Um, actually, I had a great uh, combine interview with Vegas, so okay. I had a good I had a good feeling about them, and um, yeah, I didn't really know what area I was gonna go. Uh, just try to my goal was to be in a, be in the first round at the start of the year, and uh, luckily I was I was picked there. But yeah, no really high expectations. How, how many teams interviewed you, and do you have any uh, like Terry Ryan type stories where you were getting grilled by one of the GMs? I think I had 28 out of 30, oh my, 31. That's ridiculous. Yeah, the combine was a long week for me. Uh, it, was, it was a hard week. Uh, Do you remember the three teams that didn't? No. 
You're uh, like, what the hell did I do against these guys? <laughs> <laughs> they but must it, have w- not liked me. I was off the board. When you say you, it was a great interview, like more so that you crushed it and you felt real confident, or were you kind of vibing with Vegas's front office? Yeah, vibing with them. Um, George McPhee seemed to, we had a good connection, and yeah. I think my answers did well for what they were looking for. And uh, they had three first round picks, so. Uh, they had a good opportunity to get me. So he's a pretty in intimidating area. guy, McPhee, too. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's been around, um, but he was great. I mean, he's the one that traded me. But uh, the, the conversation that we had at the trade went, went really well, and he just said it's part of the, part of hockey and had to make a deal for the NHL team. So I mean, can't really. Do and it. you could have gone a lot worse places. Like go, you know, going yeah. to Montreal must have been pretty cool. But going back, you said you grew up in London. Yeah. So like. The GTHL, right? Like, it seems such a madhouse, and obviously there's so many players. Was it almost a little better for you, like, in London, where it's not such a mad rush in the youth hockey scene, where you're still coming down playing all those teams, right? Like, did you have a lot of good kids your age in London? Yeah, our London team was really good. Uh, I think we won five of the seven years in minor hockey. No way. So we we always had good players. Must have loved beating the Toronto teams, too. Yeah. Well, the London Knights were funding it. (laughs) <laughs> he was making 100 what, g's I, yeah, when he was 12 yeah, yeah. <laughs> did you Kinda dream of playing for london because like you could probably go into the games growing up right yeah i went to a ton of games always watched them on fridays and yeah. stuff so um yeah it was would have been cool but i'm kind of i was i kind of like not playing in london yep. going moving away to a, a billet family and um trying to try to make the nhl do you still go back to london in the summers yeah, last summer was my first summer away from London, but uh, every single summer other than that one, I've been going back and training there. Where did you, you spend? Where did you spend last summer? I was in Montreal all summer, so I got to train and skate with a bunch of guys uh, from yeah. around there. Well, I was going to ask you about spending your summers in London. Like, did you get involved in that infamous skate that they have going there? There's like Doughty's there. I mean, yeah, is Dursey there as well? Uh, there's not, but uh, Perry yeah. must be right. There's tons yeah, of Pears, guys. Pears, Doughty, Couture, Horvat. Kairu, wow. me. Uh, yeah, we got a, a bunch of guys. So you just <laughs> wanted to stay to around play. Montreal this summer, like just to be like working out with more of the guys in the team, staying around the facilities and stuff? Yeah, so I bought a I bought a house uh, last spring, so I'm just kind of renovating that right now. And I uh, just wanted to st- stay close and be around that. And uh, yeah, trained with a gun- few of the guys on the team and I uh, got to participate in like a three-on-three league in, in Montreal. So uh, just to meet more guys around. What's it like going through a renovation, being captain of the Montreal Canadiens? Because Wit's going through one right now. I'm going through one right now. It, it seems like it's hell most of yeah, the time. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, it's a long process for sure. Uh, but, I mean, it, my cred around the city probably helps out a little bit. <laughs> First world problems. Are <laughs> well, it didn't help McDavid. Fucking Edmund did. He was still bitching about his. Yeah, exactly. Well, the guy, at least, you know, at least the super's like, all right, this is the captain of the yeah. Canadians. We got to go fix his... Uh... Like, if you want this plumbing issue to go away, I'm going to need some front row seats now. I'm going to need, some, need, need my kid to sing the anthem. I host, my wife uh, needs a pair of socks, too. I hosted our uh, contractor team and design team, so I think it might have I pushed them a little bit. Big so, time. That's yeah, big they time. had fun at the game. That's awesome. You had a great rookie year. You made the all-rookie team. But the next year, you guys went to the Stanley Cup final. Like, Dom Duchamp took over for Claude Julien. What, like, what changed with that coaching change that was able to propel you guys to go all the way to the Stanley Cup final at that time? Yeah, uh, I think we just had a team that was kind of underperforming, and um, it was a weird year overall. But yeah. um, I think with Dom coming in, uh, just kind of gave our team a little more energy, added some veteran guys, and – uh, once we made the playoffs, it just kind of clicked, and we were playing some of our our best hockey of the season. Just kind of kept ramping up, and the city was just, had a different buzz to it. So just going to the every game was a different feeling. Did you have to pinch yourself at all during that? I mean, you know, no one was expecting you guys to get that far. Then here it is, the Montreal Canadiens back in the stadium. And you final. beat Vegas too. Like, yeah, yeah. cool for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that must that felt pretty good. <laughs> but yeah, when we went to uh, Vegas for the first time, it was a sold out building and. We were playing in front oh, yeah, of nobody. Oh, yeah, you had any fans that whole we run. Had, we had nobody, and all of a sudden, Vegas, it's the loudest building we've played in in years. So it was such a change for us. So much better, though, having the fans back. That must have been outstanding. That that run was crazy, though. Like, it's just crazy to see kind of what's happened since. I mean, it's probably been a little difficult for you, even though you're playing a ton, you're an all-star. Like, you just want to be on a winning team. But are you guys starting to see at least like the foundations in place to, to change this thing around over the next few years? Yeah, for sure. Um, once Marty came in, uh, 
just a different style of play. Uh, brought a lot of good young talent in. Um, I think our future is one of the brightest in, in the NHL, and uh, it's really fun to be a part of that. But I know the, the struggles have been tough mentally just to go through that. Yeah. But uh, I think we just have to look to the future and uh, kind of grind it out like some of the other teams have done. And I mean, you can see Colorado was they were finished hor- dead they were last, and now they're the, one of the best teams in the league. So it's kind of the process that every team goes through if you want to build something. Well, that clip ended up going viral of St. Louis working with Caulfield, and then he scored that exact situation in the game. Is there a lot of one-on-one stuff, a lot of video work, a lot of you know, meetings with, with, with St. Louis specifically? Yeah, I don't know if you guys know him at all, but he's yeah, probably one of the smartest hockey guys I've been around. Um, just the, the way he sees things is is just different than every other coach I've I've been around, and uh, he's been in everyone's shoes um, from fourth line to, to first line. So I think he has great examples to every single player down the lineup, and yeah, when he shows Cole that, Cole pulls it off, and um, yeah, it's, he just. He's a special guy, and uh, everyone loves playing for him. Is, is there like a specific example like that you had with him in that regard? You said he just sees things differently. Where is this like a day to day thing where he's pulling you in and showing you something? And you're like, how the fuck did you see that? <laughs> yeah, he tries to leave me alone a little bit to to figure it out. But if, whenever he sees something, he'll pull me aside or on the bench. I mean, we we talk about the power play a lot with him. Um, but yeah, he helps me at five on five. Um, a ton and just little video clips that he'll pull pull me aside and look at. Do like did you feel like a, a, an added pressure when you were given the captaincy or given that amount of time that you had to think about it? Have you just been even keel and, and exactly the way you were, were before you got it? Yeah, I didn't. I tried not to put any more pressure on myself. Um, obviously, it comes with a bit more expectation in media and uh, just being a good leader of the team and. Uh, I think I've been doing a pretty good job of it and just trying to be myself is the most important thing and that's what a bunch of guys told me to do so I'm just trying to stick to that like even in interviews are you afraid of like slipping up because all of a sudden you have like you're dealing with the the, the French media in in Montreal because I feel like they try they try to stir it up quite a bit I mean you're just you're basically like the New York Yankees in Canada yeah I mean you don't want to say things that can be taken controversial but I mean they do a pretty good job of of helping us with the media and giving us pointers um if you say something that maybe you shouldn't say that our media team does a good job of trying to keep it code red code red (laughs) so like yeah we have a good team to help us all through all that when Marty first comes in that first day, obviously he has limited coaching ability. I'm sorry, limited coaching history. I Shot at say. Marty right no, now. No, 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 never, never. He did come <laughs> from Pee Wee Hockey. Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> I fucked up my words. But he comes in, not, not much of a coach in history, but th- is that even relevant with a guy like him because of his history? You just like automatically pay attention to the guy? Yeah, I mean, it, it made no difference to us. Right. Uh, once he walked in the room, everyone knew who he was and just uh, what a career he had. And uh, everyone had respect for him right away. So, um yeah, it didn't really matter that he came from Pee Wee, but I mean, he might be one of the best coaches in the NHL already. So, uh, Gordon he's great Bombay. For us. And any examples of him coming in and just like flipping out on you guys at all this year? Or is he pretty level headed? I mean, I feel like he's a positive energy guy, but at some point, has there been yeah. some games he's lost his mind? <laughs> the, the quick he, wick? He's super positive. Uh, some, sometimes he thinks he's too positive, but. Uh, That's better I mean, than too negative. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, he doesn't really flipped out that much. Some some games where we have bad period, he'll come in and try to fire the boys up. But yeah. um, other than that, he he hasn't had a big show yet. And and for you personally, are you somebody who's watching all your your shifts from the night before? Are you are you are you big into like watching the games you've played to learn, or you kind of just moving forward to the next game? Yeah, I watch a lot after uh, each game, so I'm a pretty big student of the game like that. And yeah, I just want to try to keep getting better and see. You try to watch other guys around the league too and yeah i was gonna say are you watching on your off nights are you some guys don't even watch hockey but are you watching other nhl games a lot yeah uh whenever bit biz is on tv i try <laughs> to catch it <laughs> but hopefully uh, he says something that ends up causing a controversy then. <laughs> you guys must just fucking roll your eyes at some of the shit i say then too right i like it okay like it makes the tv fun did so. you like when i said that the islanders were a snooze fest <laughs> yeah there you go. We played them. And it was 2-1. So. There you go. Oh, shocker. Well, yeah. They can't score more than two. So, <laughs> uh, What you take with iPads on the bench? I know that that's been a big talk lately this season. Oh, iPads? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big iPad guy on the bench, but Marty won't let us use it until TV timeouts. He blocks them? 
Okay, that's that's like well, puts a timer on torts. You can only he doesn't use block them, but he doesn't want guys. He wants guys focusing on the game. I've gotten in trouble a couple of times with him already for trying to use it not on a TV timeout. But yeah, guys are good at it though. What's the what's the story behind? Uh, it's Caulfield and, and uh, Dvorak. They have these Louis Vuitton bucket hats. Yeah, it doesn't seem much like Christian Dvorak to wear a Louis Vuitton bucket hat. <laughs> no, Cole's really opened them up this year, which is good to see. Uh, Devo is a really funny guy and uh, no one really gets to see it but Cole kind of has brought that out of him but I don't know they've found these LV bucket hats somewhere and bought them and now they wear them on every after every time we went on the road they're always on the plane with them why uh, what were they calling Caulfield again the the big cock he yeah, told he's us got a, he's just, got a hog does he have a well, I don't think we can ask him is that, that when you guys were golfing that's when yeah. we were golfing that's what he said his nickname was but I mean remember he wouldn't say it we're like what is it he's like cock the yeah, big, Webby, like, Webby gave, said he was the cock. That was his name. That's, the, that's what that was. <laughs> Webber's Webby, yeah. final touches on the organization. I was the it? thimble. <laughs> <laughs> I was the light switch. Yeah. What were you, R.A.? I button on a fur coat. Yeah, I don't think I have a nickname about my Pekka. So okay. I don't know if I have that. <laughs> I think it could be a good or bad thing. I'll take nothing. I'd rather have a, a no nickname than a bad nickname. Is, is he is he the jester in the room, Caulfield? Oh yeah. I mean, I don't know how much Alec how he has that much energy every single day. He just comes in dancing and singing and yelling everywhere. And Even his first year in the league, right off the hop, he was the guy talking the most in the room? Uh, he was a bit shy at first, but, I mean, the guys opened him up pretty quick, and he got comfortable, and his, his personality takes over every time. Um, I remember, like, when I played in Anaheim, Niedermeyer was the captain, but Getzlaff, he was, he was obviously a leader, and, like, I was struggling most of the time, but he would take me to the side and, like, talk to me. Like, last year, Caulfield, I know you're young, but... He was struggling right before Marty came in. Did you ever talk to him, like try to kind of like see how he's doing, or, or are you kind of staying away from guys in terms of their own game? No, yeah, we we're really close, so uh, we talked about it a lot and just trying to help him through it. And I mean, yeah, we were playing together, and then he kind of just kept going down the lineup, and it was kind of a dark time. And he's yeah. never not scored. I, I know, mean, so it must so have been like, hard. It was, it was hard, and then when he got sent down to Laval, it was a pretty dark day, and just felt bad for him i mean he yeah. had a ton of ex expectations to like win rookie of the year and stuff so yeah but once he came back and marty came in as a new kid and uh, he's been playing unreal ever since do, do, like i mean i kind of the storyline was that maybe ducharme's system put a bit of a stranglehold on the offense did you guys feel that was the case or was it just a, a, a slump that you guys went through where he was collateral damage yeah i think he was definitely collateral damage i mean we lost Pricey and Webby and Corey Perry in one summer. So it was like a bunch of great leaders and players. I mean, they played big minutes and obviously Pricey is the best goalie in, in the league. So just losing that. And then we had a ton of inju injuries and a long playoff run. It was just a perfect storm that we've been, been saying. So what did you learn from the worm in your time playing with him? He's just an <laughs> interesting guy. Just acts I before yeah, I love games how like dialed in and he is with his pregame. Oh yeah. It's just every every, every minute he knows. He's what got to a, do. he's got a Paul Korea style stretch routine. He's yeah. all dialed in. Coffee. Yeah, he's the best. Yeah. I mean he is every he would like say gotta be moving at like the exact same time. So like we're <laughs> everyone just waits for it. And like you, you, you know <laughs> you know where he's gonna be every single point. So I mean, he was awesome. Like one of the best guys. Are you superstitious what, like what? that pregame? You have the same thing bit. all the time. It's more of a routine. I like it doesn't really affect me, but yeah, yeah, I got stuff that I do pretty much every game. What's the What's the gotta be moving? What's the What's the backstory on that? I don't know. He was just He would just sit there. Like when he first got him, he would just sit there, and then all of a sudden he'd stand up and walk out of the room, and like middle of the way, he's like, "Gotta be moving." <laughs> No one knows what it's from, so I don't know. We got, you got to ask. He's talking him. to himself to get, yeah. to get the legs going. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where that came from, but yeah, it's just something we say now. Yeah. You and Cole had pretty good chemistry right away. Is that something that's just like inherent? Like you just don't even have to talk to each other. Like like first time he's out, they like kind of know, know where each other are gonna be. Yeah, right right away when I met him, we clicked pretty well. Um, he's the same age as my brother, so he's kind of a, a little brother to me, and uh, our personalities are. Uh, work well together he's more of the loud guy and I'm more of the quiet guy so we kind of balance each other out but uh, yeah playing with him has been a ton of fun I know where he's going to be and he's usually putting the puck in the net when I pass it to him so uh, it's a good pairing for sure have you ever done any acting given that you were at that art school was that acting? part of the gig uh, we had we had some drama yeah not not much acting but little commercials here and there yeah 
What about uh, what do you call it when you when they throw things at you? Ra and, the, and that Im- improv. 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 No, no, improv. I'd be terrible at that. Okay, yeah, that'd be terrible. Um, what What about TV shows? What do you do with your spare time to to keep entertained? Yeah, TV shows. Um, Netflix is a big one. I'm I watch YouTube a lot more than Netflix probably though. Like the like no the content kidding. creators on YouTube. Yeah, like golf stuff. Yep. Um, I watch Good Good a lot. I don't know if you know who that didn't is. They, didn't they have some drama and they break did up? Have some drama. Yeah. Do you know? The, do you follow the drama then? Yeah, actually. Yeah. Okay, explain it two, to us. Yeah, they had two guys leave the group. The first. kid Grant left, right? Yeah, Grant left. Micah left. I don't know. I took an interest to these guys a while ago, so I've um, been following them for a while. And these two guys left. No, no, really big reason. I don't know, but one. Two of these guys signed with TaylorMade. The other guys signed with Callaway. Oh, so it's it's so legit. It's a, little, it's a little battle right now. It's do pretty you, fun. Do you watch the Sandbaggers? Yeah. You would, watch, you would you ever compete in a Sandbagger? Would I? Yeah, probably. Well, Caulfield's already been taken. We smoked him and Zegris. Uh, who, brutal. Who would be your partner? Buddy, they brought their dads out, and then they each four-putted the green. Yeah, exactly. It was ugly. Well, Zegris <laughs> said he was like a three, and I don't know. Maybe he's a three some days, but that what day did Cole he say? wasn't. I think Cole was getting a lot of strokes. Eight. Cole like has a money swing and he loves golf. I bet you he ends up being really good. But he was hitting muffins. Too I knew I knew we were gonna take him down when they wore matching outfits. Yeah, that's, that's the. That's I went to Michigan and golf with Cole in the summer. He was playing pretty well. Yes, yeah, I think he's his, gonna get. He can better. hit his drive far. Really? Yeah. Oh, that day was a power was outage. Yeah. Power outage. So who who would you pick if you if you ended up competing against us? Do I need a good teammate or? A, like well, I mean, getting strokes isn't a bad thing. It's worked out for us, right, Wit? Yeah, exactly. Biz is an absolute stroke monster. How many strokes you get now? I get. Uh, I'm down to 14. I think the next oh, one I might good. go down to 13. We'll see. We'll see what what, what type of course and where we're playing. We got from. some good golfers. Um, I mean, kind of out of left field. Ryan Paling is a sick golfer. Is he? Yeah, sick golfer. Okay, all right. I'd, I'd love to. Is go. it bad? I don't know who that is. Ryan Paling is now on, on the pens. Pen- he was with me. Okay. Yep. Yeah. No, he's a player. Any anyone who's not Beauty a fourth too. line plug. <laughs> <laughs> this is what the name. Is. <laughs> uh, who else? That's the USA hockey. Guy. I mean, yeah. Josh Anderson. Wit knows Josh. So. Yep. Yeah. He'd okay. Be all right. There it is. Uh, Bez just mentioned uh, TV shows. Any movies? You a big movie guy on the road or just in general? Um, not a huge movie no. guy. More, right. of, yeah. He's more of stealing teammates' money playing cards. Yeah. Because I heard you're the, you're the best card you're the player. Shark? Yes. Card shark, yeah. What ga- what's the team game on the plane? We play uh, 13 up, like 13 down. It was, yeah. it was only Hold'em when I played. Now yeah. it's all, well, I guess oh, yeah. some, some was Schnarps, but I don't know 13 up, 13 Schnarps down. Is, Schnarps is okay. But yeah, 13 is like, I don't know, it's the same as 7 up, 7 down, but oh. we play the whole deck. So four guys, the whole deck's out. Dvorak's good. Big money on the plane, or does it keep it, keep it light? Our table's bigger, but uh, <laughs> Gallagher's a little cheap. Okay, so he's at the, Gallagher's at the yeah, kid Gallagher's table? Yeah, Gallagher's at the kid table with <laughs> Evans, and, but uh, Josh, uh, yeah, Josh is pretty good. But we need to we need to combine tables. I think. Yeah, they don't want the big it, action. It, it, is, is Gallagher a, a Jim Hardo during the season? I know he's pretty intense in the off season with his training. Yeah, because his dad's his trainer. Yes, yeah, is he dad, really? Yeah, his dad takes it very seriously. Good trainer. Galley always comes in in really good shape. But I don't know. In the during the season, he he's usually a little banged up, so he doesn't get to work out that much. <laughs> We've got about 30 games left in the season. I mean, playoffs probably unlikely. Does the coach even bring that up at this point, or is it just like working towards some next year? Like, what's the what's the goal from here on in, in the season for the Canadians? Yeah, our goal all season is just to build the culture, uh, build the team atmosphere, and I think we've been doing a really good job of that. I mean, we got 12 regulars out of the lineup probably right now. Right. So oh. we've called up a bunch of guys from Laval. They've been doing a great job and just trying to, keep from our team to the AHL team just like all the same culture and same style of play and I think that's what our good teams are doing now and um, we're just trying to emulate that and guess Amadi's a huge part of that yeah um, he sets the tone every single day practice is always fun Uh, we're competing hard uh, but at the same time we, we know we're just trying to get better and uh, it's a great day to come to the rink every day. Are, are you in like constant contact with Kent Hughes? Are you ever meeting with him as the GM, or is he kind of just letting you guys play? 
Yeah, he's around a lot. Same with uh, Gortz. So uh, we get to see them on, on a regular basis. And But, yeah, he just kind of lets us play, and he's going to do his job. And, um, yeah, he just wants us to do the best we can and see where that takes us. For you personally, like, is there some certain aspect of your game you want to get better? Like, I know every summer you're looking to get better overall, but is there something that, that's a part of your game you want to really focus on improving? Yeah, uh, like you said, in a lot of different areas, just uh, defensively, face-offs. Yep. As a center, it's so important. I've been below 50% uh, so far in my career, but just trying to work with the linesmen better, know what other guys are doing. I mean, you pretty much take the same take face-offs against the same guys all the time yeah so but there's so many good guys and just to get better in that area is a big one who's you, the hardest player for you to play against like in your career so far like a guy you're like oh i'm, I'm in one tonight <laughs> uh, every night i mean yeah i get to play against the best guys every True. night but um who i mean there's so, it's always fun going up against like the leafs and just all the talent they have yeah. and um sid and barkov um, Barkov gave us a run the last game we were in Florida. So, yeah, um, yeah. there's so many guys that uh, I love competing against them and seeing what I can do against them. You mentioned that you're going to eat tonight with the Molson family. Uh, do you beat the pot? Do you beat the credit card up when you go to eat with them? <laughs> Surf and turf? Yeah, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to get tonight, but, I mean, he pays my check, so maybe I should... <laughs> I will should, you offer maybe to pay? Maybe dinner, yeah. will you put out the credit card first yeah, to see the sure, reaction yeah. you get? I'll, I mean, I'd pay for dinner. Okay. Yeah. All He's right. bringing his kids, so uh, they're always a good time. What's the biggest distraction about playing in Montreal? <sighs> Probably social media, but I try to stay off it. But really? Yeah. Don't check the mentions. Yeah. Try not to, but it's I mean, impossible. Sometimes you you got to, but <laughs> are you are you single in that city? No, I got a girlfriend. Okay, yeah, that's probably yeah. a good thing okay, to we'll keep you out of trouble. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> There's not much going on in the city, so that's no. good. <laughs> Social media for, for yeah, a lot of varieties. Right there. There's no yeah. good places to go. Oh, that's what I heard. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't have anything else. But no, we, man, we, we appreciate you coming in. It's it's an exciting time. Oh, I just wanted to ask. There's a bummer about Slavkovsky going down, but what yeah. have you seen in his game? You think he's going to be a beast in a few years? Oh, yeah. I mean, you can see the size he is at 18 and – uh, just the strength that he has and if we, he hasn't played much of the North American game so yeah. I think just for him to keep getting better is going to be important for us and uh, yeah you can see the talent every single day and I think he was putting it together and, and then obviously got hurt so he's, he seems like kind of a goofball off the ice like oh yeah he's a big goofball that's yeah great. all our young guys are great uh, they're always they're always hanging out and keeping each other company so they got we got a good group of really really good young guys that's awesome. Well, we appreciate your time, man. I mean, already uh, two All-Star games. It's only your fourth year, Captain. So congrats on all the success, and we appreciate you joining the show. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Big thanks to Nick for coming by a hotel room the other day for a nice chat. Enjoyed, uh, enjoyed chat with him for a little bit. Biz, this, how good is this kid going to be when his career peak comes? What do you see him as, like an 80-point guy, 100-point guy? He, he, he's a bar goon. He's a student of the game. And uh, he's going to knit us a pair of socks. So I'm pretty pumped. This guy could do it all. It was a great conversation. So thank you to Nick Suzuki. And a uh, li little tame, though. You know, we're going to probably get some get him on again down down the road and maybe get some more stories out of him. But uh, he's got he's to become a seasoned vet before that happens. A young captain in Montreal, you know, he's going to be a little, a little, uh, he's a be a little careful, right? Yes. You don't want to say no something one. that the media can run with. Oh, yeah. Fucking sneeze and they run with it there. Plus, Twitter will uh, tell us the difference between crocheting and knitting, whatever that is. Biz, did you find out yet? No, I thought you would have been all no, over I that. No, I did. Maybe obviously the technique <laughs> has something to do with it, but I mean, knitting's knitting, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, guys, before we move on, I just wanted to mention uh, Julia's Hope Cup. Uh, a friend of mine, Paul Turner, uh, his daughter passed away years ago from a brain tumor, an extremely sad story. And uh, she was into philanthropy, and, and in her honor, uh, he created Julia's Hope Cup, and it's a Canadian pond hockey and carnival. Uh, it's taking place Saturday, February 18th, so a few weeks here, and that'll be going on. And let me just read this quickly. It'll give you a little bit more detail. Uh, we are pleased to announce that the 12th annual annual Julius Hope Cup will be returning to our traditional annual pond hockey tournament and carnival on Saturday, February 18th at Chippewa Park Pond in Welland, Ontario. And uh, all proceeds for this, the silent auction, as I remembered, 
or, or as I mentioned, excuse me, um, it's raising funds for the Hope Center in Welland, Ontario. So a great cause, and I hope everybody who goes has a great time. And thank you to Paul Turner for mentioning it to me, and I'm glad I got to announce it on the pod. So uh, any other information, as I said, go to juliashopecup.ca, and uh, you'll find out all the details and, uh, and money that you can uh, donate as well. So thank you. How about this crazy story from the SPHL, the Southern Professional Hockey League? Uh, thanks to at Rory Del Baco for the tip. The team there, Vermilion County of the SPHL, no showed for their, their home game versus Quad City. Do what was nuts? Quad City come out, did the warm ups. They lined up for an actual face off. The five guys on the ice, no opposition, just the referees and officials. So this was from Dave Yaminian, uh, uh, I think you pronounce it from the Peoria Journal Star. Drama in Vermilion County. The Quad City Storm bust to Danville for their 4, p- 4 p.m. game with VC. Only the QC team took the ice for warm-ups. Pre-game skate ended 10 minutes ago. There's no sign of a home team. Puck scheduled to drop in five minutes. The team did not show, but we got to give full props to the Quad City team. The opposition that didn't show, Vermillion County, they were supposed to meet the fans after the game and have a skate around the rink with them. Well, the Quad City team ended up staying in with the oh, fans who no. were supposed to be there to boo them. So that's a hell of a gesture, man. You go all the way to travel there. team doesn't show up. You know, they did the right thing. They went out and, and hung out with the fans, took a that few laps with them. That sounds like... That sounds like the paychecks not hitting the account for at least maybe one, maybe two paychecks. So yeah. guys are probably like, hey, that's all that sounds like to me. Why would you not show up for a fucking home game? Yeah. And it doesn't say four- anything else as to why they didn't show up. Uh, let's see. The drama in Danville, the host never showed up for game. It's a forfeit win for QC. Most bizarre thing no, I've I seen No, I understand that. Years. But yeah. the, 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 the team fold? Nothing? No other no, news? I, they just I, didn't show for no. they, they sonked the away team. How, how long to, was the bus ride? I don't know the distance from Danville to wherever the, the other team is, but I went to the website because I tried to buy tickets while well, I went through the process. They were still scalping, selling tickets on the website. Tickets so already? I got to that, you know, to the point where it hit, hit the button here to buy tickets. So they haven't folded. I know they wrote it on Wikipedia, they folded, but they hadn't folded. So either way, kind of a wild story to see you know, a team. Show up the face-off circle, no opposition. But again, we want to give a salute to the Quad City Storm for taking care of the fans that did show up. He's uh, about points. love skating with uh, some opposing fans. He could have been balls deep with a boosty on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a oh, in the SP, I you. bet you they're all rockets too. I know you came. <laughs> know you came here to see me fight. Yeah. I'll show you something else. Yeah, Margaret, you want a piece of me? <laughs> you ever seen a, a covered wagon from Welland? Oh, yeah. Baby, come over here. Oh I'll God, I saw a fucking, uh, I saw a clip on the internet on Twitter the other day. It passed by. Some girl did a fucking shot out of a guy's foreskin at the bar. No, that's what the kids are doing now. It's fucking that, these kids are. What kind of Twitter? accounts are you following on Twitter here? No, this? buddy, it just fucking. It was a random fucking Twitter. Right, at, right boom, right there. Girl, fourzy shot down oh, the hatchet. God, they call, they, they're calling it the calamari cocktail. <laughs> that's what they're calling it, G. <laughs> Hey, don't look, don't laugh at me and ask what I'm following, dude. This is all these fucked up kids that are your age that are gonna get taken over by robots one day. So you fucking, you guys are all, all. Hey, going back to the balloon thing, what do you make of this stuff? And what do you make of uh, another thing that keeps popping up as far as like, oh yeah, like, w- w- like the Chinese people like basically owning TikTok and having all this information from Americans, hundreds of millions of Americans on this app. That is controlled by by China. Let's go to you for. The, we've discussed what the TikTok in Chinese in China shows kids, right? Math so, equations. I mean, we, Sudoku we've been, puzzles. We've been through. Like, you want to be a doctor? You want to be a scientist? You, that's what they look up to. Here, we get to have our kids watching TikToks of shots out of Biz's extra force, extra skin on his hog. So, like, the fact that you know, if if you, what were they doing at one point? Cooking chicken in like bleach or something like wasn't that a TikTok trend? Not Ni- sure. Was it Nyquil? Something? Drinking, yeah, dr- putting. Actually, putting, come to think of it, I, I, I didn't. Pods. I didn't even actually see that eating on Twitter. Tide that was pods. actually that's what are you? That's what our youth crush and so that's I actually good. that was me at Kodak Black's after hours. I just fucking <laughs> actually just crossed my mind that was that wasn't on Twitter. Fuck. You me. started washing the dishes with your mouth. <laughs> I saw this on fucking Twitter, and I'm not following all these crazy accounts. I follow, like, Brazzers, the worst account that I follow as far as, like, maybe, like, offsideness, but they followed me, so I followed them back. Yeah, Brazzers is a good account. That's not, not, nothing wrong with little they Brazzers. Passed, they gave me a free password via DM, so I was like, fucking right, follow all day long. Share um, it with the boys. 
uh, well, we're, oh, we're, we're, we're talking about the balloon thing. So right. what, what do you got? What do you make of all this? All right. Are you okay I mean, with China stealing our information? I don't think they were obviously trying to be sneaky with whatever they were even doing, if it was even them. I didn't follow the story much over the weekend. But at this point, dude, I assume all these companies have all my fucking information already. Like, I'll say cream spinach into my phone, right? And two hours later, there'll be a fucking ad for cream spinach on there. Whatever. I don't. I mean, it is what it is. We work. We use these things. Nobody reads the fine print. They probably have all our info, whether it's the Chinese, Americans. I don't really give a fuck. I mean, I don't know. I get nothing to hide at this stage. Yeah, we're, so in, we're in one. We're in one. Not me. I'm not on TikTok. I'm Neither saved. am I. Yeah, I tried. I, I just couldn't get, couldn't figure it out. I'm the old. I I downloaded it about two, three years ago, and then for four hours straight, didn't move my couch, just going up, 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 and I said, nope, that is bad news, bears. Deleted it on the spot. I love it. I rip a talk a day, every day. Got to get one in. Got to post. <laughs> I rip a talk a day. That's a perfect I want to saw, I want to saw my cock off it. after hearing that one. Yo, how was Someone's not before do doing a shot out of it. Rip to, Someone's rip to talk. <laughs> You're up, R.A. Connor Bedad failed to record a point for the first time in 35 WHL games. He had 44 goals and 44 assists for 90 total points over that run. I think that, kid, man. that's 88 points, isn't it? 44 and 44? 40, I said 46. Oh, 44 I'm sorry, buddy. 46. That's okay, buddy. But... Obviously, we've talked about this kid pretty much every week. We know what he's all about. Can't wait to see where he ends up. Uh, we already mentioned earlier, boys, we are on the road this week. We're all heading to Scottsdale. Well, today, Tuesday, I believe, with the rest of the Barstool contingent. You guys are playing in the mini golf tournament, correct? Yes, that's oh, yeah. Wednesday at 3 o'clock Eastern. You can watch that on the Barstool YouTube. Also, I think every single brand that has somebody yep. um, playing, so Spit and Chicklets will be live streaming. Me and Biz the entire time. Foreplay will be live streaming. Riggs and Frankie. Uh, we're in a group with me, Biz, uh, the self-proclaimed greatest mini golf player in the country, I think, Kirk Minahan, or maybe he said he was a top 10 player in the, in the country. Uh, so we'll see if he can live up to the, his, his hype. Uh, and then Riggs, right? Riggs sucks at golf, but he can putt. I'll give him credit. The guy can putt. So Biz and I are in one. I believe there's 16 players, and the top eight move on to the final round. There's two rounds. So that'll be a pretty fun, fun thing. I know, I know uh, Hank Lockwood is the guy who's kind of spearheaded this entire effort, so you can watch it live. That'll be a lot of fun. And then Thursday, we're doing trivia. Our squad, who's I think we're a top five team. I don't know how, but we're a top five team. RA is a beast. Biz is a lot better than people think. I am bad at trivia, man. I can be honest. I stink at trivia. But once in a while, I could come through in the clutch. So in live live pressure in, in, in front of fans, maybe we pull out a couple victories and take that title down. We're also getting another sandbagger. We're not willing to say who that's going to be with, but it's a very exciting one. Definitely an original one in terms of who we're playing against, a little different than our prior 16. And I think after that, we'll hopefully get a couple interviews and, and maybe hopefully get over to the Waste Management at one point. I've never been to that event. I'd love to. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it's going to be a great Super Bowl week with the Barstool crew for sure. And you Lots can, uh, you can watch. You can watch the Biz and Wit feed for the mini golf. That'll be live streaming on the Spit and Chicklets Instagram. So all those live feeds will be on the brand's Instagram accounts. And we're also doing a little uh, little party Wednesday night at the Barstool Sports Bar at the Barstool Sports Bar. Yeah, at, in Scottsdale. So you can meet us there as well. And that's going to be a little bit of a big deal brewing event, is it not? Absolutely, Ooh. the big deals will yeah. be flowing. So, there. so I know that. Uh, I know a lot of you have messaged me. It's been hard to find the Scottsdale area, but uh, recently they updated the Find Me app. So, Grinnell, you can give more of the details as to what the exact exact Find Me app or where you can find it. But I believe there's 50 locations now in the greater Phoenix Scottsdale, Scottsdale area that carry Big Deal Brew. And if you haven't tried it yet, it's a free sampling. Uh, yeah, free sampling. Come on over to uh, the Barstool Sportsbook Bar. Oh, my God. It's the Barstool Sports Bar, not Sportsbook Bar, but you can gamble in Arizona. And come over there and sample it on Wednesday night. Uh, also, the trivia is at 9.30 Eastern time. That'll be live on YouTube, or you can just go to Barstool Sports. They can direct you in the right place. Check that out. I think I think uh, we got a pretty good shot at winning. I know who we're playing. We're not going to mention that yet. By the we're way, not I allowed to mention it? I, don't, I think they want to kind of keep it under wraps. I don't want right. to then have to edit it. We look like we just all got indicted in these pictures of us, especially me and Biz, totally fucking mug shots. But we oh, I look like I'm 86 years old. It's, it's, it's <laughs> under, under You're talking about the graphic they post of us? The oh, same yeah. one every time? I think it's pissy, yeah. It's uh, funny. Also, At some point I say, like, 
I'm always like, man, that's such a bad picture of me, Grinnell. Like, oh, memes, what the fuck? That picture of me is terrible. It's like, I think I got to just look in the mirror. Like, when every picture's bad of yourself, like, maybe it's just your face. So I like this one. I hate the one of me. I look like Jabba the Hutt with no fucking neck. I was like, oh, man, we got we to gotta gas that one. Uh, we also have a Pink Whitney bottle signing Wednesday night, 5 to 7, at Total Wine on 1607 East Camelback Road in Phoenix. So, that's 1670 East Camelback Road in Scottsdale, Arizona, all right? Not 1607. Okay, I have dyslexia or a, I a Pink Whitney a mistake. A Pink Whitney signing is always a lot of fun. You get to sign bottles, get to sign different pictures, and we appreciate everyone who drinks that. So thanks for coming out to that. That'll be a good one. And, of course, the big game is Sunday. Wit Philadelphia is uh, minus one and a half with a 50 and a half total. You like anybody leaning any way here? What do you got going on? Yeah, I'm leaning towards the Eagles. Um I don't know. Like this game isn't really. It's a, it doesn't have me too fired up. Hopefully, it's a good game. That's all I root for when the Patriots aren't in. I just want to be entertained the entire time. But that Eagles team's nice. I know it's kind of crazy to bet against Mahomes. He's so good. Probably so much better than than Jalen Hurts. But that Eagles team, their defense. I don't know. I think. I think. I feel like it's their year. What about you, Biz? Any uh, best I got the interest? Eagles. I don't know fuck all about football, but I feel like everyone's been doubting the Eagles. Every game, I, I feel like everyone thinks, like, oh, this will be the game that they lose. But, no, you mentioned that defense. I think that Hurts has been buzzing. Yeah, he, I know. didn't he light up, the, light up the Giants, and they had a great defense all year? So I'm, I'm taking the Eagles. I think it's going to be entertaining because their fans are scumbags and very aggressive, and so are Chiefs fans. Those are two hardcore, riled-up fan bases. Would you go to the game if you yeah, had a free ticket? No. Biz? no. I think football's 10 times better on television. Goes wow. back to the TV timeouts, the slowing down of the action. Uh, and now there's there's more and more review, so I want to see the angles over and over again on television. So, no. I want to sit on my couch and watch the game. I'm not interested. If somebody gave me tickets, I'd go. But nowadays, to go to a Super Bowl event, you're talking 1500 bucks to get in the door, no? I think Unless I'm like more. you and I sneak in. <laughs> no, I, I've been to one Super Bowl. I, I paid fucking two grand for my ticket. No, I, thanks. Yeah, it was an all-timer, though. Uh, a couple other notes here. FDNY versus NYPD Hockey is on April 15th. G, how's that running along so far? It's coming along. We got the documentary coming as well. You can donate to the uh, all the money we're raising at uh, barstoolsports.com slash hockey heroes. It's going to be an absolute blast as each day goes by. We have more and more and more special guests, different cool things that we're working on for the game. So we're super excited for that. Yeah, I can't wait for that. It should be good good stuff coming. I uh, got to send the uh, RIP out to Melinda Dillon. You guys know her as Suzanne Hanrahan from Slapshot. Also, she was the mother in Christmas Story, and um, she was in uh, what else, a couple other famous movies. But, yeah, epic epic movies. I mean, she was in the probably the one of the best sports movies ever, one of the best Christmas movies ever, and one of the best science fiction movies ever, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. What, you a fan of her work? Are you familiar with it or what? Yeah, great perky breasts in the one scene. I, know, where... I hate to be, I didn't even want to be the one to bring it up now, but oh my God, those, the well, old, I just old think 70 of that tits, scene the when, ski slopes. Yeah, just like, like the they went up a little bit, off. they were just very nice and like, you know, rest in peace. <laughs> What? Uh, all right. I <laughs> just I was expecting it to go that way, but I suppose when you, oh, your main scene uh, is with Paul Newman. I think everybody office. was thinking it and Witt said it. Yeah. Just yeah. especially from the sl- scene in Slapshot. I was a young kid the first time I saw that. Listen, it's, that's something that gets ingrained in your mind. Absolutely. See us in your memory. What else, boys? Uh, you guys all off tomorrow? Heading out? Oh, it would be today, Tuesday. You guys all yeah. geared up and ready to rock and roll? This is a quick turn. I'm about the opposite of geared up and ready to rock and roll, but... When you have no water, no heat, it's probably good to go to a hotel. So, <laughs> so Biz, where do, where, you get the renovations going on. So are you still staying there? Are you, are you staying somewhere else? How's that all work? No, out? no. I rented an apartment for the full year, RA. Right. So, right, good. You, so if you want to go check out my reno, you, you, you're more than welcome to stop by. I can show all you guys where I'm going to be living probably in about nine months. Great setup. I'm going to have the, the sauna, as I mentioned, with, uh, with Wit getting his cold tub. The cold uh, heat. The, the combo. I'm going to be setting up the contrast. That at my home gym. The contrast. That's the word I was looking for. All right. If we but ever, I, if Biz is like, hey, want to come over and see my reno, like see the property, be like, yeah, we'd we'd be banging nails in within 10 minutes of being there. 100%. Hey, let's just get this done quick. Like four hours later, I'm begging him for a sandwich. I'll put you motherfuckers to work. I, I know scared. you will. Oh, I know I'll, you I'll will. I'll be having baby. Grinelli up there doing the roofing. 
I was only asking in case they end up with a Super Bowl ticket, Paul. I want to crash on your couch if that's all right. If you want to, if you want to sleep on an air mattress in a, in a in a house that doesn't even have the drywall up yet, feel free, buddy. <laughs> that wouldn't be the first time. All right, boys, fun episode, great interviews, and uh, check in next week. Have a fantastic week, all. Sounds good. Love you guys. Peace.